We're live. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and warm uh, and a warm welcome to everyone to this uh, third workshop on API essentials for the public sector innovation. Um, I will briefly explain the rules of the house. So uh, we will appreciate if you mute yourselves and switch off your cameras unless uh, you are taking the floor. So, um, and just informing you that uh, we are planning to record the session and, uh, and to use the chat and the Q&A um, to, to process and condense a summary of this event that we will make available in um, as informal occasions on our um, API for DT um, uh, page on, on join up um, that we will be sending you on the chat later. Um, so will any participants wish not to be recorded or mentioned on the events proceedings, please send us uh, or an email or let us know and we will proceed uh, accordingly. Um, we are very happy to see that um, our event has again attracted uh, such an audience from uh, both the, the public and the private sectors. Um, I would like to thank indeed to our co-organizer at the API Days, whose uh, co-founder Megdi Medjawali is here uh, with us for helping us to bring also the private sector to this uh, interesting co-creative co dialogue. My name is uh, Monica Posada. I am a research fellow at the Digital Economy Unit in the European Commission, and I'm currently leading the API research team. Um, the um, API for IPS project to which um, I'm leading is a joint effort among three European Commission's directorates. Um, uh, DigiConnect, DigiDigit, and DigiGRC. Uh, they represent respectively the policy, the implementation, and the research actions, and the research actors involved in analyzing uh, government's digital transformation in Europe. Specifically, the project aims to identify technical, legal, and organizational essentials that will ensure efficient, competitive, and robust API-enabled digital ecosystems. In the former two events of the API series that we've organized, we explore technical essentials that organizations need to address uh, in their API infrastructures to harness their digital transformation processes such as the API management, discoverability, and security. Today, the, the, the argument will be a little bit different. We are going to start uh, exploring the legal and regulatory aspects of APIs. Next slide, please. So, um, the APIs, um, uh, the research that we've uh, we've been uh, doing the last uh, during the last two years have uh, reached some conclusions, and uh, um, of course, uh, it's deniable that the APIs are technical enablers of data sharing. Um, they are actually the connecting nodes of the European digital fabric. Um, APIs define what data can be accessed, who can access it, and under which conditions. And uh, API infrastructure can monitor the data use and the consumption behavior. This information is very useful to improve processes and operations in organizations, to assess potential threats and uh, support the development of mitigation measures, and uh, to identify key partners. Uh, the, yeah, so uh, what is the current, uh, the, the uh, European Union at the moment is basically defining the, 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 the regulatory environment of the European strategy for data. So Europe at the moment um, is, is uh, busy indeed 
with the co recovery from the pandemic situation that we, we are um, all go going through. Uh, but um, it has put a very positive vision on, on how to get out of this uh, situation. And um, the, the vision is to, to invest, to, be, to, to get to have a strong, competitive and resilient green and digital Europe. Um, so in all this um, um, uh, landscape, what's, uh, what's the role of API on, on, uh, on the regulatory process that can help to achieve this vision? So um, first, I would like to mention the, 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 the regulatory environments that are already enforced and that ha somehow had something to do with APIs. One of them is the General Data Protection Regulation and the other one is the Payment Service Directive uh, 2. Um, both of them have got a very different approach to, uh, to their implementation, at least on the technical part. And we will today go um, and, and, um, and uh, analyze um, the difference and compare both of them. Other regulations that are currently in implementation phase do already explicitly mention APIs. Um, this, uh, this regulation can be uh, the public sector information and the open data. Um, uh, which is uh, which is going to be uh, in enforced very very soon, um, and but not only that. What are the role of APIs for future regulation? We have currently the Data Governance Act, the Digital Market Act, and the Digital Service Act that are all uh, putting some um, 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 putting the field in order to make a competitive and uh, and resilient. Um, digital uh, Europe, um, and therefore, in all this this uh, event today is meant to um, to throw some line and to uh, start uh, the ball rolling into um, understanding um, where where APIs have something uh, to do in this. Next slide, please. So. Um, the general objective of this uh, of the, the our event series is to unveil uh, uh, secure, reliable, and sustainable paths for the innovation of the public sector using APIs. And uh, in this series, we want to do it by establishing a dialogue between uh, the public and the private API practitioners, and to jointly identify um, solutions to to challenges and also opportunities. Um, specifically today, we will uh, analyze the role of APIs in, in uh, the implementation of uh, data regulatory processes and also to explore innovative ways to, to use APIs for, um, for the, um, uh, for the uh, um, flourishing of the digital, um, of the digital Europe. Next slide, please. So quickly going through the through the agenda. Um, uh, so today um, now I'm, I'm just doing the, the introduction. Um, we will we will go to the um, de then to 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 set up um, a, a talk from uh, my colleague Nestor Dutch Brown, who is a research leader of the Digital Economy Unit. In, um, and, and he will talk about the European data strategy and the work that we have been doing in support of the definition of, of uh, some of these um, uh, regulatory actions. Um, then we will have Francis, Francois Xavier uh, Cao, who will um, talk about um, the state of GDPR portability um, from the implementation side. It will be very interesting to hear about um, and a study that they've done on the current status of the implementation of data portability in, in uh, companies within Europe. Then uh, we will have Professor Marcos Zachariadis. He will talk about um, developing data sharing frameworks um, such as, as uh, the one that has been created in, in the financial and banking sector. And uh, finally, we will have a discussion panel that uh, will be moderated by Mehdi, Mehdi uh, Medjawi with uh, panelists uh, from, uh, from experts uh, worldwide, such as Keen Lane, 
the API evangelist, Mark Boyd, who is uh, um, the CEO of Transformable, and Tyler Singletary, he is the product manager of TagBoard. Um, they will be discussing uh, innovative um, um, actions such as um, API neutrality. Um, I'm not sure. So I think that uh, with this, I would like to give the floor to to um, Megdi. May, 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 um, I'm not sure if um, uh, Dietmar Gandwinkel is around. No. Okay. So I will give the floor to 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 Megdi. Hello, Megdi. Thanks a lot for for your support on this. Um, I really would like uh, to 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 start as soon as possible with with the um, with the interesting uh, presentations that we have uh, in front of us this afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much, Monica. And just to say, uh, Dietmar is in the attendee list, but he's uh, muted. So I think if you wanted him uh, to uh, uh, to speak, he has to raise the hand, and then I think we can give him the audio, uh, right? So Dietmar, if you can raise the hand, I'm, I'm sure we will be able to uh, uh, to find a way to have you here. So uh, waiting for that. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, uh, European Commission API days are really glad to present you all. This, uh, uh, this event uh, on topics that are really important, uh, portability, but yes, how we do it? Do we do it with regulation, GDPR, and let's say uh, li like strong governance and fear of, uh, of, of, uh, of fines or company willingness to, uh, to collaborate? Or do we do it with technical elements that will enable it to uh, to do on the, in a free market approach, right? So this is exactly the debate we will have today. We will present the state of GDPR, the state of API-led regulations, but how APIs actually can solve the current GDPR portability issues that are directly on the market, right? So this is exactly what we're talking about. And for that, the first uh, of our speaker uh, will be uh, uh, Nestor, uh, Nestor Dutch Brown, uh, who is research leader in the Digital Economy Unit at the European Commission, and who will present us the European data strategy uh, right. Hello, Nestor. Are you able to get the mic and share your slides with us? Perfect. And we just add uh, uh, before, if you have any questions, you have the chat. Uh, please ask the question when you feel them, and I will I will uh, take the uh, I will have the role to ask the the questions uh, to the all the panelists today. So don't hesitate. It's a discussion. Uh, don't hesitate to engage to have a, to have it live. Yeah. Hello, Nestor. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. The stage is yours for 30 minutes. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, start by uh, thanking the organizers to, to, for the invitation to present um, the, uh, the European Data Strategy. My, my presentation is going to be basically a very general overview of, um, of, of the strategy and, and obviously uh, perhaps we will uh, have the opportunity to, to spend some, some time at the end for questions and answers. And obviously I invite you to consult the, uh, the text of the strategy that is available in, in the commission uh, website and also perhaps to look at uh, the different materials and, uh, and, and documents that have been uploaded uh, recently also to complement the, um, the original uh, strategy that is already uh, getting one year old. Uh, so many things have happened uh, since then. Um, okay, uh, in terms of the content of the presentation, I basically will follow more or less the structure of the document. So I will basically talk about what's the aim of the strategy, a little bit about the timing and the time horizon, the, um, the, the, uh, some of the causes of, 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 this, of, this, of this strategy, what, what, what is at stake, at least according to the commission uh, view. Uh, as as uh, Monica just mentioned before, uh, perhaps we need also to check what has been already done and, and how this strategy will complement previous initiatives in terms of data. Uh, let me uh, then explain you a little bit about what's the vision uh, embedded in, in this strategy. Some of the problems that the strategy uh, aims uh, to, to solve. Uh, and then obviously we will talk about the four pillars uh, of the strategy, uh, a little bit of a look of the international approach to, to the strategies, how, how Europe envisages itself 
in 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 uh, in, in, in let's say in the world the markets of of, of of data, and and then perhaps we can have some uh, a series of questions and answers uh, if you agree. So first, uh, as, as, as as a as a justification for for the strategy, let me tell you that the vision of the Commission right at this stage is that obviously data is becoming uh, a, a very important asset in many respects and uh, with a lot of uh, socioeconomic potential to become a transformative force or a transformative input for for many economic activities and, and, and a lot of services that can be improved uh, uh, in order to help people. Uh, and one of the things is that uh, obviously the volume of data that has been uh, generated uh, in the world has been raising a lot and the expectations and so on. So projections into the future already tell us that the volume of data that will be created in, in the coming years is, is going to uh, grow exponentially. So all these requires um, several, several, a strategy that is multidimensional, multidimensional in the sense that we need uh, technical solutions to be able to handle all this volume of data. But on the other hand, we also need uh, a structure, let's say a more social structure or a, or a legal structure that allows that the usage of this data is done according to, uh, in, in our case, er European values, but obviously in order also to be uh, more as, as efficient as possible in the utilization of this data, uh, particularly for the targets that the, the, the EU Commission would like to would like to uh, target them to. Another another important issue is that um, um, how the data uh, processing will 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 be is is also uh, expected to change them dramatically in the coming years, and uh, and we will observe. Um, um, a, a switch in, in, in how um, the data is, is stored and, and, and used and processed. Uh, we will pass from this 80-20 uh, proportion in terms of the centralized versus uh, edge uh, generation and processing of data uh, to a, a completely reverse the situation in which only 20% of the data is going to be centralized while 80% of the data will be generated and perhaps uh, processed um, at, the, at the edge. So this will also require a significant change in the framework uh, that uh, is uh, used to uh, handle data and uh, to regulate how data is used. So what's the aim of the strategy? Uh, well, as, as you can read, uh, this is a, a direct extract from the text. Uh, it's very clear. Uh, the European data strategy uh, aims to make the EU a leader in a data-driven society uh, by means of creating this single market for data uh, that will allow data will flow freely within the EU and across sectors for the benefit of businesses, researchers, public administrations, and the general public as well. So uh, the ambitions are, are high, um, clearly, and uh, and uh, if you if you read carefully this uh, this statement, that you will you will uh, Im immediately recognize that data here is 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 is, is being to the equal terms to people, capital, and um, and uh, and goods, uh, which are uh, the, the 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 goods. Uh, let's say that the. the the production factors that freely move around the single market. So considering data at the same level of people, et cetera, is, is really putting data as one of the main inputs for, for, for let's say, the uh, economy of the future. So this is, uh, in, in my opinion, a quite important, uh, quite important achievement. Uh, what's the timing? So the strategy was uh, uh, communicated, was, was uh, made public in February 2020 along with two important documents. Uh, so uh, the uh, communication also on shaping Europe's digital future, we basically also initiated the, the commission work on, the, uh, on two important legislative uh, measures that, uh, that Monica already uh, mentioned. In the introduction, the Digital Services Act that will also uh, take care of reorganizing a little bit the uh, the, the liability regime with respect to content in, in digital in the digital arena, and the Digital Markets Act, which on the contrary will look at uh, competition in digital markets. 
Um, and, and the third piece that was made public in the same date was the white paper on artificial intelligence. Obviously, we cannot think about artificial intelligence without also thinking immediately on data. So all the machine learning techniques and the algorithms need to be trained with data and data is fundamental for the future of artificial intelligence. So all three communications are related. All these, let's say, are three pillars of the same uh, strategy, which is the uh, digital future of Europe. Um, what's the time horizon? Well, in principle, the data strategy is uh, having a five years horizon, which is the, the one that corresponds to the ongoing commission. We will see to what extent some of the measures that will come late in this in this period will also be uh, let's say inherited uh, by the by the new commission the new college that will that will come to the commission in um, in, in the next period but uh, but obviously the whole idea is to have a series of legislative measures that will allow the uh, european uh, data economy to um, to to thrive in in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the next decade or so so there are uh, many issues at stake. Let me basically also, in terms of, uh, of being brief and allowing some, some time for discussion at the end. Uh, so the three main justifications for, for the strategy, let's say would be uh, obviously the issues related to the growing data volumes and technological change. This uh, was already mentioned at the beginning. Obviously the importance of data for the economy and society as a whole. And, um, and obviously that the EU has uh, the willingness to become an important player in uh, the data economy in the future and uh, to leverage on all the infrastructure and the skills that, uh, that the Europeans already have in this. So uh, let's say that uh, this is one of uh, the sector that is considered stra strategic or an activity that is considered strategic where the, the, the Europe cannot really afford to be a laggard. So uh, what has been done so far? So we need obviously to frame the, the current strategy in, uh, in, 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 um, in, in the context of other initiatives uh, around data that have been already passed by the commission and approved by the parliament and council. For instance, the general data protection regulation that we know all uh, takes, uh, a, a, let's say a particular focus on personal data and, uh, and implies a series of um, rules that operators need to need to respect, but there are many more uh, apart from those that Monica mentioned at the beginning. For instance, the regulation on the free flow of non-personal data. This is, let's say, the counterpart of the GDPR in terms of allowing that data uh, generated per perhaps by machines or more industrial data can also be moved uh, in the uh, borders of the EU freely between different services. Uh, there is uh, the, also the ongoing Cybersecurity Act, which obviously is important and will become even more important as the digitalization advances. Uh, we also have the Open Data Directive. We have several uh, sector-specific legislation around data, for instance, in automotive, in payment services, uh, as PS2 what was mentioned by Monica before, but the, also the smart metering information, electricity network data, intelligent transport systems, etc., And also we have the digital content directive. So if we, if, we, if we add to this, the Digital Services Act, as was mentioned in the beginning, the Digital Markets Act, and, and others that have been passed recently, uh, obviously we have um, a, a large set of initiatives that somehow are, are dealing with data. Uh, what's the vision of the strategy? Well, the vision and embedded uh, in, in the strategy uh, is multi-dimensional and more or less a summary can be, can be found in the slide. So one, one of the main issues that, uh, that the data strategy is looking for is to allow that data can freely flow within the EU and across sectors. Uh, mobility of data is uh, considered crucial as an important factor that will allow some industries and some countries to <laughs> become more competitive. A second important element is that uh, all data legislation should uh, respect the European values and rules. In particular, for instance, in, in respect to uh, personal data protection, 
consumer protection, competition law, uh, all the laws and, uh, and, uh, and regulations that uh, we already have should be, should be respected. Um, the strategy also um, looks for um, creating rules for access and use of data that are fair, practical and clear, and there are clear, clear and trustworthy data governance mechanisms in place. As we will see, there is a particular uh, legislation or activity that is dealing with data governance uh, so in order precisely to, to achieve this, this important, this important uh, objective. And uh, finally, uh, there is also the interest to participate in the international arena with respect to data flows. And uh, according to the vision of the strategy, there should be an open but assertive approach to the international data flows based obviously on European values. We should respect European values at all costs. Okay, what are the problems identified by the, by the strategy and uh, precisely that the strategy is uh, trying to solve? First of all, there is the, the, the let's say, perennial uh, problem of fragmentation between member states. If each member state starts by legislating on their own, this creates uh, um, a very fragmented um, uh, scenario where um, <clears throat> there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, what are the rules that have to be respected. And this uncertainty is clearly negative for the economic uh, atmosphere. Uh, obviously, this reduces investment and, uh, and, and obviously the economic, the economic potential of, of the activities around data. So what we need to do or, or what, the, what the strategy looks to, to guarantee is to avoid this fragmentation between member states and, uh, and create a single market for data where the rules are the same for everybody, uh, that the market of the, uh, the size of the market is, is also higher than, than any uh, national market and where obviously then <clears throat> the data economy can grow and become more important. There are problems in terms of availability of data uh, in, in several of the, of the different domains. And here we talk about issues regarding government to business data, but also business to business data, business to government data, government to government data. It's, 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 it's really um, a, a series of um, specific barriers that block sharing and, and exchange of data between different stakeholders. And, uh, and the strategy looks at uh, identifying those barriers and obviously trying to promote some measures that will uh, bring these barriers down. Third problem is uh, related to market power. There are some operators, uh, mostly uh, big tech companies that obviously given their position in the market are clearly amassing uh, large amounts of data. And uh, obviously uh, thanks to data-driven network effects, these companies can uh, leverage this data to become even more powerful, while at the same time they um, block entry uh, uh, to other competitors, which creates obviously a very uh, unfair um, um, market in, in which uh, firms can operate. Uh, this, in principle, is going to be uh, tackled by, by digital, the Digital Markets Act, and as, as perhaps you can, you, you, you know already, if you have seen the proposal, there are a series of obligations for, for big platforms, for big technological companies that will, uh, that will have to, to somehow open their, um, their, their data to, to, other, to other competitors, and uh, particularly allowing also for for uh, for data portability uh, for business users in particular, uh, and obviously another problem is uh, is related to data interoperability and quality, and, and many and many more. For instance, issues uh, around data governance, data infrastructures and technologies, how to empower individuals to exercise their rights, particularly also in terms of data portability, but also issues related to skills uh, and data literacy. And as we mentioned before, with the act, uh, the corresponding act, also issues around cybersecurity. So the problems around data are, 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 are quite a few. And the data uh, strategy, in principle, is, is trying to tackle them all. The strategy is based on four main pillars. 
we will go for uh, in detail on, on each one of these uh, for for trying to understand what are the main actions that each of these pillars will will imply. So the pillars are uh, a cross-sectoral governance framework for data access and use, uh, a series of enables, enablers, which means investments in data uh, that will strengthen the European capability and infrastructure for hosting, processing, and using data. In terms of competences, meaning empowering individuals, investing in skills, and obviously helping SMEs to jump into the data bandwagon and obviously uh, common European data spaces in strategic sectors and domains of public interest. What are the key actions that the strategy uh, foresees with respect to the, each, each pillar? For instance, in the case of cross-sectoral governance framework, the key actions proposed by the strategy are a legislative framework for the governance of common European data spaces. This is already ongoing. Uh, adopt an implementing act on high value data sets that this is already ongoing. Uh, this is the uh, kind of the, the milestone for the year 2021 is precisely this data act that will take care of uh, many issues related to data sharing, the many dimensions that we already, uh, we already discussed. And obviously also the analysis of the relevance of data in the digital economy uh, uh, which is basically what the Digital Markets Act included in this Digital Services Act package was already uh, tackling or, or proposing uh, uh, back in, in December when, when it was uh, launched. Uh, we will see how um, the negotiations with Parliament and Council will, will modify this particular piece of legislation in, in, in the coming months. Uh, here, uh, the role of APIs is explicitly recognized in um, in, uh, in the data strategy with respect to the implementation of the high value data sets, okay? So here, as you can see, um, the, um, the, the, the data strategy immediately associates the, the capacity to uh, exchange data uh, from the public, uh, serv uh, public, uh, public services provision to, to the pub to the general public through API. So the importance of APIs is already recognized in, in the data strategy. Uh, what about the enablers? The key, the key actions here would be uh, obviously the creation of these European data spaces that is in principle uh, expected for 2022. Also, um, uh, an under a memorandum of understanding uh, on the cloud federation that is uh, in principle ongoing. Um, the launch of an European cloud services marketplace that would in principle integrate the full stack of cloud services offering in uh, by the end of 2022. And obviously um, uh, also creating a EU self-regulatory cloud rule book in, um, in uh, also in this uh, in next year, mid, mid of next year. Uh, with respect to the competences, uh, the, the, the objective would be to empower individuals with respect to their data, basically by, as I mentioned before, enhancing portability uh, rights for under the Article 20 of the GDPR, but also uh, under the <coughs> uh, Digital Euro program, a lot of investments in, 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 uh, in infrastructure, also investments in, skill, in skills and general data literacy, and obviously uh, not uh, losing uh, uh, the site of, of SMEs, which as, as you know, in, in Europe is, is a quite important component of, of the economy. Um, the list of common European data spaces, uh, meaning the sectors that uh, are considered strategic are obviously uh, related to manufacturing, the Green Deal, which deals with uh, environment and, 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 and um, and sustainability, mobility, health, financial, energy, agriculture, public administration, and uh, human skills, which means that obviously many major uh, economic activities will, will, will have their own European data space and many others. As far as I remember, there are already ongoing discussions about the media European data space, which also be very useful for, um, for cultural uh, <coughs> production in, in Europe. Um, and finally, there is also the uh, in, intention to, to make uh, Europe an important player 
in the international arena with respect to data. And there are two important activities or, or goals uh, around this, this, <laughs> this major objective. One would be to create a European analytical framework for measuring data flows. Uh, obviously, this um, can only be done in cooperation with relevant international organizations. And obviously, uh, a second activity uh, would be to promote the EU standards and values with, with the partners around the world. Uh, let me basically finish my, my presentation with this summary uh, of uh, some of the more important data policies. Here you can see uh, these four main legislative actions with respect to data. So it's the Data Governance Act that is already ongoing, the Digital Markets Act that is already ongoing, the Implementing Act on the, under the Open Data Directive that is coming very soon, and obviously the, the milestone for this year that is going to be the Data Act uh, in the third quarter of 2021. So all this uh, creates um, an important um, set of legislative actions around data. Uh, perhaps you would immediately uh, think that some of these uh, actions might overlap each other. And it's important that um, we are able to provide uh, the commission with uh, with an overview uh, and analysis of, of how these things would operate and which actors which stakeholders would would be mostly impacted by these different uh, actions or legislations in order to make sure that the final design of the policies are are, are well targeted and do not necessarily generate a lot of uh, regulatory uncertainty to to the players in in the different activities Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, and um, I'm I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you you may have. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Nestor. Uh, we have uh, some time for questions. We have a first question uh, ab uh, about like uh, the question is from uh, uh, Piotrowski Rafal, who say that will this strategy create a baseline for new regulations, or will it also affect existing ones? You take the example, would it tackle difference in implementation of PSD2 on different markets? No, just an example. Uh, well, uh, it's quite hard to tell at this, at this, at this stage. Um, my, my impression is it's just an impression uh, from uh, my personal um, uh, understanding of, of how things will, will develop is that uh, the PS2 will have its own, uh, let's say, development path and is going to be reviewed independently of the rest of the uh, legislative actions that the Commission will, will implement in the future. Basically, because it started sooner, uh, has specific uh, goals and, and aims. And, uh, and obviously, uh, as soon as we understand a bit better the effects of PS2, uh, in the financial sector in per, or in, uh, and in banks in particular, we might then perhaps extrapolate some of, the, of this knowledge to other sectors and learn from, from, from mistakes and also from, from the things that, 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 were, that, that are okay. So there might be some sort of a leakage from, from ongoing experiments, well, experiments, ongoing legislative actions, let's say, to, to new legislative actions. But, but as far as I understand from how the data strategy is designed, this is not necessarily uh, considered at this stage. Okay. Uh, so if, uh, yeah, uh, Rafael, thanks you for, for the answer. Uh, one question also about, uh, let's say, let's say how the decision is made on, let's say the technical feasibility versus the policy goal, right? So can you explain a little bit how in you know under European Commission the discussion are led is the law needs to make the industry and the business happen or is the law is 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 thought to push what already started like how do you create these two ideas? Well, um, perhaps I'm not the <laughs> the right person to answer this question because I am not uh, involved in 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 the policy making itself. I'm basically mostly on, on, on the research side, trying to uh, provide some evidence to, to my policy maker colleagues in Brussels. But, uh, but my, my experience, at least in the discussions with, with, with my colleagues, is that obviously 
they have uh, a very deep understanding of what's going on in, 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 in the different activities. And they are constantly talking to stakeholders. So basically the, their policy design doesn't come from a vacuum, it comes from the fact that they are constantly discussing with different stakeholders, understanding what are the needs for big companies, what are the needs for small companies, what are the needs for uh, individual users. Um, which means that uh, at the end, you know, the, 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 the problem with policy is that uh, somehow you need to square the circle in the sense of uh, try to design measures that should address the main issues without uh, having a major negative impact in, in those things that uh, already work well. So this is really complex uh, and, and that requires, let's say, a, a lot of expertise, requires also in, in, some, in some cases, uh, uh, hard decisions eh? because uh, it's, it's sometimes difficult to, to really uh, make compromises uh, among all possible stakeholders. Uh, and, and then you need to decide, you need to decide uh, according to uh, the European values and according to the objectives of the of the of the Commission and the, and the policymakers, what which sacrifices are the least uh, the least damage, the, the the ones that create the, the less damage as possible. Uh, so it's, it's always a, a trade-off between uh, uh, benefits and, and costs, and and provided that the benefits uh, are higher than the costs, we we can say that obviously the measures have some uh, let's say. Uh, positive impact, impact on welfare, uh, although we know that uh, it's always there are winners and losers. We have a question, thank you. We have a question from Haluk in Amnis. Uh, how is EU data strategy positioned against regulation like uh, CDR in Australia, like customer data rights in Australia, for example, if you know it? Well, I'm, I'm not uh, too aware of it, but obviously uh, what I know is that uh, the Commission uh, is engaged in, uh, in uh, multilateral dialogue with, uh, with a lot of, uh, of countries and, and other economic blocs around the world to make sure that the decisions taken here are uh, compatible with, with other decisions made in other jurisdictions. Uh, not only because that's the right thing to do, but uh, more so because uh, we, as many other countries in the world, are bound by the rules of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, which means that any measure that can damage foreign, um, foreign uh, companies willing to uh, operate in Europe, for instance, or European companies that willing to operate in Australia are subject to, to the same rules which means that you have to design your legislation also in consideration of the rules of the international uh, uh, organizations like WTO in this case. So um, I'm, I don't know the pe peculiarities of, of, of the CDR, but I'm pretty sure that uh, there is an alignment or perhaps there are obviously differences, but, but, but there is kind of an alignment in the general terms with, with, uh, with, with, with all these regulations. Uh, otherwise, the commission would be violating its uh, international treatments already signed, which can obviously trigger um, some trade wars and other things that I'm pretty sure uh, uh, our politicians will not necessarily like. So this also is, is another dimension that we need to take into consideration. Yeah, thank you, Nestor. It's true that we always, we sometimes, when we are not on this side, we forget uh, all the constraints that are in place to in, to push new regulations, international law, industry law. You know, uh, so it's uh, it's really it's and, and we don't when we don't know the constraints, sometimes we're too exigent, right? But when we know the constraint, actually, we understand why things are made, right? So. Thank you for telling us a little bit about this. Uh, so we are exactly at 30 minutes. It was great timing. Thank you, Nestor. Uh, and again, you. you can us with us to answer the next question and participate. And now we Perfect. have um, uh, François Xavier Cao, uh, uh, who will join us. François Xavier, if you are both. Yes, do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, uh, yeah, the stage is yours. And uh, Thanks. Uh, yeah, let's have a great discussion. And I think I will. I will participate to, to that uh, to that talk right about the, the last part right yes right so i will share my screen yes so send me when it's good when it's okay
Hello, Mehdi? Yeah, the stage is yours. Yeah, you okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for inviting me, inviting us to to this uh, to present you this this brief report about uh, a little study that we conducted, Mehdi, Mehdi, and I, about the state of uh, data portability in the GDPR. So, the first question that might come to your mind uh, would be why did we decide to conduct such a study about data portability? To, to first answer, uh, I would like to quote our French President Emmanuel Macron, who said just recently uh, that the United States, United States has the GAFA, uh, China has BITEX, but what about Europe? Um, we have the GDPR. And one of the most uh, interesting uh, innovations that uh, was included in the GDPR is actually uh, the right to data portability. Data portability is um, represents a, a huge potential for EU citizens, for businesses, and for countries. Uh, the first time uh, I read uh, the, um, the, the Article 20 of the GDPR, I couldn't believe what I was reading, <laughs> because I think that it started to change uh, a, a really, um, it started a new era in the digi digital market for uh, for European Union. and. I think, for example, for, for citizens, uh, an effective right to data portability uh, means that they now have the capacity to make real choices uh, only on their own and not without paying, uh, and not, uh, with paying atten attention to who historically hold their data and use it to keep them captive uh, within their services. They now have the choice to, uh, to select the services that offer them the best customer experience ever using this data as an asset and not, and not an, as a captive lever. Also, uh, this free flow of users and customers enabled by data portability will imply to, to empower them with uh, the ability of choosing if they want or not monetize their own data. But it will, it will be just their choices. And one, one more thing is just that the users and the customers now uh, with data portability should be able to um, to to manually uh, not to to not manually if indeed uh, recreate the whole identity when they try to change uh, their services uh, and their providers. For EU businesses, uh, the impacts of data portability are in fact the reflex of uh, the EU citizens' ones. It's, it's to say that it involves, of course, a more fair and active competition within the, the digital market. And uh, for most of uh, the businesses, like SMEs and startups, it is an, an opportunity to get more uh, data <clears throat> and better capacity in, to innovate and create the future uh, European services that we are all waiting for. It's to say the, big, the future big tech companies uh, that, that will be uh, able to, 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 to lead the competition as I with the GAFAMs and the BETEX. So, um, and more generally for the EU market, uh, the, the largely available flow of valuable data will help them to, to create uh, more opportunity to, uh, for a, a better growth within the, the EU market. So, but we're just talking about value, but how much value is captured by data and has the potential of being redistributed. Indeed, we have two ways uh, of create value with data. There is a direct one in, in which uh, that consists indeed in the fact that one stakeholder sell, sells the data and then uh, with this data, he's, for example, enriching his own database, like contacts, details for leads and behaviors uh, of, uh, for example, um, buying uh, or selling uh, actions. But the indirect one, uh, the second in the, uh, indirect valuation way, is when the data is not sold or not exchanged, but just keep captive, keep for your own and uh, reuse to create upsells to uh, try to keep the user uh, within your service without giving him the possibility to change or to try any other service. And that's what we should normally uh, try to decrease as a, as a general effect, thanks to the data portability. If we take a look at Facebook, for example, it is possible to estimate uh, the revenue generated by users' data, taking into account the fact that 98% of, uh, 
of uh, their Facebook revenue comes from uh, advertising and, and advertisement related activities. So uh, we know that Facebook generates about $21 billion revenue per quarter with $2.7 billion uh, monthly users. So therefore we can guess that uh, Facebook generates $31 per uh, of average revenue per uh, user. And as well, we can, of course, uh, take the Facebook uh, current uh, market valuation, financial valuation, uh, and divide it by uh, the numbers of monthly active users. And we can reach an average market uh, value of each user's data that is equal to $259. But what we can see as well, it's that uh, this value changes according to the locations where uh, the people uh, are living or are using Facebook from. But something has to be made clear here is the fact that the, the data generated by Facebook is over-optimized for Facebook activities. It's to say that normally none of the other economic actors should uh, be able to extract more value from the Facebook data than Facebook himself. So, that's why it is really important for the EU and for uh, other competitors to uh, to create um, more uh, innovate innovations and to have a really strong know-how in data sciences. But all of this is only possible if there is a fully working implementation of data portability in compliance with the provisions of the Article 20 of the GDPR. And however, um, even before uh, the study that we conducted. Uh, Mehdi and I, and I think many of us here, uh, noticed that the implementation of the right of data portability, uh, the right to data portability, was too often uh, put aside of the GDPR compliance uh, actions plans of many companies and non-profit organizations. So one day, we, we just wanted to try uh, to use our own right uh, to request the data portability. And uh, we noticed that it was really hard to do it. So um, we wanted to know if the experience was the same for other persons and maybe for with other uh, type of companies because we only asked uh, some of the top uh, tech companies in the world. So uh, how did we do this? Um, first of all, uh, we publicly asked people uh, to take part to a process uh, in which we provided help uh, from three legal advisors, including me, uh, uh, to uh, to handle the legal support of uh, the request of the process of requesting your data portability. Then the moral engagement was uh, presented and signed by uh, the participants of this study, which is which was which was more uh, like the an opportunity to give them all the informations that was required according to the Article 13 of the GDPR. And then we created a web front app that was a JSON CSV parser uh, that was anonymizing all the data generated for, of this from this process on the fly. And with all the observations, the feedbacks that we get from uh, the participants and the data that we uh, anonymized, uh, we were able to uh, distinguish some of interesting information, create statistics that are all uh, written in a two-version uh, report that will be soon available to download. And uh, there is a lighter version of this report that is dedicated for all the persons wanting to just get information about data portability and what, what is at stake. And um, the more detailed version that is dedicated to persons that are legally interested or technically interested in data portability and more generally in data protections. So here are some of uh, the, the numbers uh, that we that we that came from our statistics. So to give you just a, a, a little idea to uh, all the participants uh, Considered, um, we had we we had a list of 200, uh, uh, 230 companies to to request data from, and uh, only sixty of them uh, actually answered to requests of these participants. One of the one of the effects of the fact that we didn't want to get in contact uh, in directly in contact with um, with the participants at at the beginning, but we just uh, uh, posted uh, tweets and other public available messages to to ask people to take part to the, to the study is the fact that we wanted to know if people were actually interested in in 
in data portability. In, in, in fact, only 48% were, uh, were proactively volunteered. But what, is, what must be noticed here is the funnel effect, is the fact that 88% of them, uh, in fact, that were motivated, uh, abandoned uh, the goal to get a copy of this data because it was too hard, because, because there were too many things to do. Uh, because they, for some, for some of them, they did just didn't understand why to do, why to use their right to data portability. So, according to what we we observed, uh, uh, thanks to the feedback that we get from the participants, we distinguished six recurrent patterns uh, that explain why GDPR, uh, GDPR data portability is broken, and how uh, data controllers were missing uh, some some. <laughs> some key points in their implementation of data portability. So the first point is the fact that the data provided by the data controllers in response to a data portability request uh, was not really transferred in a machine readable format. In fact, the uh, data controllers uh, might uh, mixing up the right to access and the right to data portability. And for example, here we have a participant uh, that was requesting his data from uh, one of the most important and oldest and systemic bank in France, and uh, it just won. So he answered to his request with a uh, with a period of four months, and uh, then uh, when we when we do when the the participant downloaded the attachment uh, that contained his right to data portability, uh, you can, here is the result uh, that you get. <laughs> it's just a, a PDF file containing that kind of information. So when you try to use your right to data portability, um, when it, uh, in, in the bank sector, for some of them, of course, not, 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 not all the banks are, are responded this way, but here is the, is the result of a request of data portability uh, used uh, toward um, a bank, a French bank. So another point he, uh, is to say that the personal data was considered too difficult to provide for some of the data controllers. Now, of the now one of the main uh, arguments that were that were used is the fact that it was sometimes too difficult to extract the data or for security reasons, it was impossible to provide the data to the data subjects. Here we have one of the most recurrent uh, case that we had among all of the, all of the participants. Um, and it was the one of Facebook, uh, of, um, well, of WhatsApp. And uh, here we have uh, a participant that was asking for uh, receiving his data according to the provision of the article 20 of the GDPR. And uh, uh, WhatsApp uh, invited him to just download a report uh, with, with data, but this data uh, did not contain, in fact, the messages and the contacts of phase of um, of the, his WhatsApp repertory. So uh, this was uh, due to the fact that WhatsApp considered that it could not uh, be able to to provide this data. Uh, due to the encryption that is applied on this data. But when you take a look at the WhatsApp documentation that is freely and publicly available, you know that you can just make a backup dump uh, on, stored on your Google Drive. And surprisingly here, the encryption is not a problem anymore. So uh, you, we, we guess that technically it, it's normally feasible, but we don't, uh, we don't understand why uh, it, should, it wouldn't be possible for any for uh, any data subject to directly ask for the data portability of the messages and the contacts. Another point uh, is, is that uh, personal data was transmitted as an empty file. Uh, this occurs, uh, in fact, when a data portability uh, does not uh, include anything useful or uh, when a data controller is, does not interpret the concept of data provided by user in, in the right way. If we take a look at uh, the guidelines that were published by the, G, the former uh, G29 uh, EDPB, uh, we can read that the term provided by includes personal data that relate to the data subject activity or result from the observation of an individual's behavior. And we have an, a very interesting example that is uh, provided within this, uh, these guidelines. 
A webmail service may allow the creation of a directory of a data subject's contract, friends, relative, family, and broader environment, etc. So normally, it, it, it is uh, considered that the data provided by user should include friends and uh, relative informations uh, or linking, linked informations. Or when you take a look at uh, the JSON files that were uh, that were downloaded by some of the participants uh using their right to data portability and using especially uh the takeout platform uh, of facebook you realize that yes uh, they provide the the first name and the last name of, of every friend and the timestamp when they became your friend but they don't provide the id of this friend is to say that it is impossible indeed to really get back your your social ne uh, network your social graph uh, because uh, when you will try to change uh, to switch from Facebook to any other social network service, uh, you won't you won't be able to match uh, all the data and reconstruct again uh, your your social network. Another point here is the fact that personal data was delayed from being provided. Uh, only 58 uh, uh, well. 58% of uh, surveyed businesses worldwide failed to address requests made from individuals seeking to obtain uh, a copy of their personal data as required by GDPR. Say so that the, the period of 30 days is, uh, is not really respected by most of the companies. And another uh, point that is linked to, that, to, that, to, to the this disrespect of the, um, of the 30 days period is the fact that the data subjects experience uh, was fragmented. Uh, the user experience of uh, a person that wants to use his right to data portability is really poor. Here we have one of the our participants uh, that wanted Airbnb to to send uh, his data fr uh, from serve from Airbnb service to uh, a public link of uh, of Dropbox that belonged to uh, this participant. So Airbnb proposed two, uh, two possibilities to, to proceed. And the second one was really interesting as, uh, in fact, they wanted uh, the participant to uh, provide Airbnb uh, informations about the, 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 context, uh, the contact at Dropbox, who is the DPO, and especially uh, an, attach a copy of a proof of identity from the person you want us to send the file. But of course, the participant didn't want to, to ask the Dropbox DPO uh, his ID card, passport, or anything of this kind. And it just linked, uh, well, it just uh, sent a message with a link uh, that was pointing to the, to the LinkedIn profile of the DPO of Dropbox. And uh, then Airbnb here answered that. Uh, they could they could not accept this proof uh, as such, and um, they they were uh, they were they were proposing to send uh, the, the data to the data subject, and then the data subject would have to send the data to the DPO itself himself. And uh, to do so, um, Airbnb proposed to encrypt uh, the, the 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 file in the, in a, under a JSON format, but here again, there was a problem because they, encou they encountered uh, technical difficulties uh, to encrypt the, the, this JSON file. So uh, they asked the participant if uh, he agreed to, uh, for the fact that Airbnb could uh, share he, the JSON file with their legal advisor uh, to uh, indeed uh, in proceed to the encryption of this JSON. So here uh, we have uh, just on, on the top, uh, the response of our of our participants consenting uh, to this approach, uh, but of course, uh, as surprise, uh, he was surprised that uh, it was really hard for a company such as uh, Airbnb to encrypt a simple JSON file. And uh, in the end, he succeeded to get his data uh, encrypted by a legal advisor on uh, on uh, on his Dropbox. And all of these uh, observations uh, should should always uh, be uh, taken carefully because uh, we also see, uh, saw that uh, only 10% of the data controllers uh, were proposing a takeout service. For those who don't know what the takeout service is, it's just a clever way uh, to um, 
to give a response to a request of data portability of, uh, and also to request uh, to access the data because it is uh, indeed an, an archive that you that you download and uh, a viewer an html viewer uh, crawls all the data that is contained in the same file and this data is is stored as a json files so you 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 answer to the two to both of these rights is to say that uh, you you have the the data that is uh, understandable by a human being, but it, that is also uh, machine readable. So uh, it is interesting, but once again there is a there is a problem that, that might arise from from all of, from this uh, type of practice. It's the fact that uh, you're mixing up the range of data that should be prov provided by uh, the by the privacy departments of data controllers. Uh, when they receive uh, requests to access the data or re requests to uh, data portability. So another another really common point is the fact that data portability requests were seen as troublemaking. And uh, sometimes it happened for, for some of the participants that uh, the data controllers didn't want actually to answer uh, the requests they received, but they proposed to just delete uh, the 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 account of the user that were requesting his the the, the his data portability, so uh, that was of course uh, a, a problem because uh, many of the participants wanting to continue to to use the services they just wanted to get a copy uh, of this uh, of their data, and this this can this kind of misrepresentation of of the right to data portability and might lead to to uh, to 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 the, to the fact that the data subjects will uh, indeed just stop uh, to send requests because they want they might fear to not be able to use uh, their account and use their services anymore. So um, one more thing um, during this study, uh, we we tried to find uh, a ruling case or a, a public decision about. Uh, that, that was sanctioning uh, any breach of uh, data portability, and we didn't find anyone. So, uh, if uh, you find one, we will be really interesting to 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 analyze it with you because uh, I've, with according to the discussions that we had with many DPOs and many um, many uh, privacy departments, we know that uh, the, the, there is a lack of legitimacy, a lack of credibility uh, of, uh, of them because the tap management only listen to what they what the DPO says uh, only if there is um, an economical or so, something that looks like a risk uh, it, because the GDPR is considered for, for some of the of the of the top managers uh, is considered as kind of a, a hidden tax indeed so uh, they want to uh, they want to avoid to spend too much uh, uh, budget in the data comply in the GDPR compliance so that's that's what we we observed uh, as uh, as but we could qualif qualify as bad points, <laughs> but there are also solutions that might uh, make the data portability uh, a reality, and that's that's why uh, I will let the floor to to Mehdi Mejawi, who conducted the study with me, and and please, Mehdi, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Of course, we will just uh, 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 we will just talk about these right and the full report that we're building that will be. Uh, are accessible for participants of, of the of the of this uh, session and webinar of course we'll detail them in more, uh, in more right but so 10 so there are policy ones there are technical ones there are business ones we will just explore them as is the first one is kind of uh, is kind of a, a normal one but it's about education I just take the example of the portability of phone numbers right the ability to keep a phone number across tele, tele carriers right uh, has been has been real has been pushed by policymakers the business was involved. Uh, there were advertisements on TV about the, the fact that you can transfer, uh, uh, um, uh, you can change a phone carrier without changing your phone number, so portability of the phone number. And actually, it was a big movement in that world. So the education of citizens and consumers were there. 
for portability were not there. So a movement of education like this involving policymakers, uh, um, uh, business owners, and uh, and let's say uh, non-profit helping consumers uh, rights would would work. But yet for port for phone number portability, it was easier to understand. For data, it's quite complex, and not everybody is has the knowledge to do effective education. But that would be the first case. The second case uh, is more about uh, simplification. We've seen there are many many obstacles to make it happen. Uh, so it can be certification about the users. It can be, uh, for example, specific, uh, uh, you know, accessibility uh, 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 certification or time or conventions that help to be sure. Yeah, you should be able to. Like anyone should be able to do a data portability request in less than whatever five minutes or two minutes or whatever, right? Uh, you know, so all the tooling and elements to make portability request easy is not uh, is definitely not there. And so simplification could come either from the policymakers obliging, you know, some some quality requirements, or from uh, let's say some uh, some entrepreneurs uh, there. But the simplification is needed for sure. The third one is the standardization. Uh, uh, for, so, so just an example here about simplification. Uh, we just uh, launched a, a, an initiative called Data Funding. It's kind of a Kickstarter for personal data where we help people to get their data to fund research projects, right? Because we do this in a stewardship, right? So just to tell you, simplification is key, right? Uh, to handle, to, to make it, to make GDPR portability real. The third one is really about standardization. Uh, we've seen that uh, policies, policymakers, when they ask for standardization uh, or specific format or specific interfaces to make it happen, actually company follow and, and, and at some point that works and that works better. This is also what we will see uh, later today. Uh, so I don't want to spoil next speakers, but yeah, standardization going further in the way to implement it, right? Even if it's, uh, there is some design choice, will will help uh, for sure. The fourth one, uh, the fourth one is develop alternative models. So Mozilla made a great work, the Mozilla Foundation, but other alternative models. Uh, of course, we have the Data Trust by the European Union, but there is data, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the data sharing, uh, sorry, uh, international data uh, spaces. But uh, you can have Data Trust, Data Commons, uh, right? So pool of, of data, data unions, as people call them. You can have data stewardship. So people helping others to collect data portability. So there are other models that just regulation and letting company uh, uh, apply the regulation by themselves, right? So you can find on this link uh, many, many alternative models of governance. The fifth one is really uh, the facility and build a transition. So actually the European Union and others are funding the transition. So there are some incubators of data portability. There are some uh, grants uh, from different foundation that helps companies to build tooling that will help it. So the funding, the transition is important. And it's funny to see that in the FinTech world, when PSD2 regulation came out, we had many, many millions and billions of dollars of investment because we knew that portability will exist. With GDPR, we didn't see this uh, data tech investment. We didn't see the billion dollars because investors and entrepreneurs don't trust yet the regulation uh, into the ability to transfer value from big actors. So we didn't see yet, but we invest more and guarantee the transition the, that the portability will be effective as it was for PSD2 and banking, we totally may see the same level of investment uh, from the entrepreneurship and so next uh, uh, funding the transition. The sixth one, uh, number six is like uh, joining for as a community. There are many people, nonprofit or uh, policymakers or business owners gathered as, uh, as, uh, as uh, institutions that fight for portability. It can be Nonprofit like mydata.org or Privacy International or Mozilla. It can be other uh, entities more business driven, like uh, uh, industry driven uh, 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 communities that, that can help definitely, right? So find your community about data portability and act like, uh, uh, act like one, uh, but as a group. The seventh one is, is, a, uh, is mandate APIs. With PSD2, we've seen that if you mandate APIs, actually banks, even if they were late, some of them, but they build APIs and they build APIs that enable instant uh, instant uh, uh, data portability between bank accounts, right? You know, for account information data or payment initiation, as the regulation states, 
it took some years, but it was at the end. And we, we can see a lot more benefits that we can see now for GDPR. So we can mandate APIs. As we've seen that with PSD2, uh, 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 banks followed. So why, why don't other companies would follow if we push for APIs directly mandated in the article in the regulation? Uh, right? Uh, so on the eights, it's uh, the eighth one, it's, uh, it's, yeah, we've seen that on over 500 fines, no, was on G no one was on GDPR portability. It was mostly on data, cons data conservation or I age of fact, uh, uh, right of access and others, but never was about Article 20. So one of the data regulator in Europe could open the floor by just find, you know, actually we found really no company that was really respecting GDPR portability. So you pick and choose, you find one uh, for the example, and at least at least all the data protection officers will consider now GDPR portability into their uh, uh, practice. So we need one. So uh, <laughs> data regulators, uh, the, the floor is yours to, uh, to find one. And the last two try to keep in the time. Disincentivize data retention with a digital value added tax on data. It was a, um, it was a task force on taxation of digital economy. It was a, a report in 2013. But just, just to say, we should just maybe disincentivize companies to uh, to, uh, to to re to do data retention by VAT on data how VAT works you pay you don't pay VAT until you release the product for someone to add value later right as long as you let add value you reopen the product you sell it you let someone add value you don't pay the VAT right this is how it works only the end consumer the one who captured the value pay the VAT the end consumer right it doesn't add value anymore to the product just consume it why we don't do this with data? As long as you share the data back to the users, right, in a fair way, you don't pay this tax. But when you collect the data and don't reopen it with a fair and open API, at some point, yeah, you are collecting the value of the data. You don't redistribute it. And so you pay VAT on data, right? So that's just an example of some proposition that have been made. And the last one is a, a push for API neutrality. So in PSD2, as long as you are registered as an AISP or PISP, right you are allowed to access a bank api the bank cannot revoke your access as long as you're registered the bank needs to be neutral for all the company registered that guarantees neutrality and right of access uh, according to the regulation if gdpr push for apis and push for api neutrality that the goal will be to be sure that everybody even a competitor even another one will have access to the apis as long as the user consents to have the data portability shared and so no, no company will be able to revoke access to a company uh, uh, because it, it doesn't whatever respect some clause that, uh, that are against the law, right? So, so that's, uh, that's the idea. So API neutrality could be enforced like PSD2. So that was the 10 examples. Uh, I think we just have, um, uh, uh, we, we had just one question about, uh, how Facebook respect my friends' privacy when exporting my relationship to them as my friends list? So from Tyler, it's a great question. Just to say, um, uh, it's true that when you have to export your data for yourself, uh, it's only your data. It doesn't, if you if Facebook share your friends' data at some point, they are, make a breach at some point. They did it from 2010, 2014 with the API. They don't do it anymore, but I totally agree with you. But Facebook itself last year in the white paper proposed to send the hash of the ID of the user, at least the application ID or the ID of the user. So if your user has in his export has a hash of all the other friends and you can compare the hash on the network, at some point you will be able to find that they were friends in an automatic way, programmable way, even if you don't have directly the ID, the ID of the of the user in the application. It's a Facebook proposal. It's not even uh, a hacktivist proposal or whatever. This is one of the Facebook proposals that they're evaluating to do this. Do they propose it just to earn time or do they propose it just to um, make it real? Uh, we will know We will know for sure. But just to say there are solutions to enable portability while respecting, uh, uh, while respecting user privacy. And we have a link of a uh, uh, GDPR fine for Italian Telecom, right? 25, 27 million, but uh, let's check if it's based on based on the legal base of portability versus another legal base, right? Uh, but thank you for sharing the link, uh, Liu. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, but we will talk uh, with Tyler and Kinlane and Mark Boyd about API neutrality uh, uh, later in the panel after actually this talk. Now we have uh, Marcos, 
uh, uh, we have uh, Marcos uh, that will join us. Uh, Marcos Zakariadis, are you able to share your screen with us? Thank you, François Xavier, also for your uh, all the, the work you're doing during your PhD on API regulation. Thank you. Hi, Marcos, are you able to join? Hi, right, thanks, Maxi. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can all hear you. And just to say, Leo Voro asked a question. We will answer uh, after uh, uh, Marco's talk. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and share some of the thoughts that fit into this uh, discussion, I think, overall. Um, in terms of what I'm going to talk about is uh, provide a little bit of background around um, data sharing and data openness in financial services how it kind of started, so how we, we, we came into the um, API's kind of regime, let's say, how regulators responded to challenges around technology, but also competition, and how that impacts, um, just to start with, the, uh, the, at the firm level, the business models of banks and financial institutions, and at the market level, the overall kind of market architecture. I'm going to end um, this presentation, which is going to be quite short, about 20 minutes, 25 minutes maximum. I'm going to end with uh, some recommendations. I will summarize from an existing policy paper I created for the Canadian banking market um, uh, last year, 2020-20. Uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, of my background, just to give you a bit of the motivation why I'm doing all this in terms of, of, of resets. Um, so my, my background is economics. So I do my PhD at the LSE. Uh, looking at uh, the um, innovation and uh, uh, network economics in finance services industry. I've, I've taken on a, a quite a few jobs in academia and uh, briefly in industry for, for two, three years working in technology and finance services sectors. And now I'm a professor at uh, University of Manchester at the Alliance Manchester Business School, where I also hold the Green Seal Chair in financial technology. Um, I'm a fellow at University of Cambridge, uh, again, doing research around fintech and collaborating workshops and, and projects um, around financial technology. And finally, I'm part of the World Economic Forum as well. We have a Global Future Council on Resilient Financial Systems, where again, we look at the role of technology in financial services. My most recent, recent appointment, which I think will uh, relate a lot with my presentation, uh, also the discussion here, is that I was appointed by the Hellenic Competition Commission to be uh, the chief fintech advisor to the president as we are um, essentially rolling out a new consultation around competition in the Greek financial services industry and see how financial technology can help um, with competition, how what what the authorities, what the government uh, can do, and how the competition commission can help to uh, to boost further kind of competition into the market as well. Now, um, to start with, uh, I think I'm going to just say that obviously data sharing in financial services is not new. You know, it's it's a phenomenon that we have seen uh, obviously dates back to um, um, applications and integrations that exist in kind of. Uh, uh, big uh, uh, financial telecommunication networks and, and also card, net, card networks like Visa and, Ma and MasterCard um, have done in the past, which is offer external APIs that can integrate their solutions to existing kind of applications. If you think about in-app in -app purchasing that they have, uh, or even web pages. So uh, in addition to that, we have, for example, other companies like PayPal and Amazon Payments, where they, they have both kind of programs for developers who are keen to integrate um, you know, their solutions, Apple, uh, no, sorry, PayPal, Amazon, and these are MasterCard kind of solutions into the websites, into their um, kind of e-commerce initiatives. So it's not something new. Um, and even if you look at further out in the industry overall, even when there are no APIs present, we had other techniques, um, you know, technologies like screen scraping, where developers can um, actually use to access and, and lift, you know, data or, or capture data stored in more closed systems, right? So that's um, examples um, of that in, in the banking sector we have uh, when, uh, you know, potentially um, you, you give the authorization through sharing your uh, username and password to a company to pretend that it's, it's you, you know, as a consumer and go into the website, web scrape all the information 
um, and use it for a different purpose. For example, they can inform you, uh, you know, what kind of spending you do, or or they can utilize this data to make a counter offer and so on and so forth. Now, the downside in terms of um, you know screen scraping and web scraping in the banking uh, sector, and finance services sector, where the data is kind of more sensitive, is obviously that this can be done if you don't share your login credentials and that's um, you know, pretty risky. If you're thinking that you know, potentially some of these third parties are not necessarily regulated and there's liabilities there that need to be controlled uh, and agreed with. So um, this was raised as a, as a big problem, especially from existing financial uh, services institutions uh, in the industry. Um, but there, there's also other technical problems, obviously, because screen scraping, if you change, if the website changes the framework of the, um, uh, you know, a script on the, on the web kind of changes, then this uh, creates kind of discontinuities, right? Um, and that's why we have seen the emergence of a new kind of uh, layer of businesses, uh, almost kind of a niche market within that sector, which does that um, on behalf of third parties who want to access information from consumers. And we have seen recently, obviously, um, for example, comments like Yodli or Plaid, which was uh, uh, very recently in the news. I'll have to correct this slide. Actually, it wasn't acquired by Visa because there was an objection by, uh, again, uh, you know, competition authorities in the US and they did not allow the transaction to take place. And in the end, they decided obviously to, um, uh, to follow different uh, roots. But you, you see, I, I guess that's there to prove that there is a lot of interest in, in these kind of organizations because they become really powerful through data aggregation, the co through concentration of data. Um, now, so there's always been an argument between screen scraping and APIs, um, you know, the banking sector, what needs to be regulated, what needs to be um, uh, uh, somehow kind of mandated in the place of, of uh, the one another. And this is a discussion that it's quite um, still going on in different jurisdictions around the world. If you look at the different debates around open data and data sharing in financial services. But one thing is certain, I think that there is kind of consensus uh, for, and, um, and that is that not, non-access to data kind of in the end can distort competition, right? So if you think about an efficient market uh, and that would function, um, you know, for the favor of the consumers, but also for the businesses involved, uh, you know, is, is one that would have transparency for prices, you know, uh, transparency in terms of quality, lower switching costs so that consumers can jump from one proposition to another and low bars to entry so new businesses can come in and uh, um, uh, produce uh, and, and suggest new products and services that are more innovative, more original and, and better quality and cheaper as well. So you have these kind of dynamic with competition, um, um, but also, you know, transparency in terms of, of the data. Now, this table here kind of was one of the very first um, examinations uh, towards what data opens can do in the financial services sector. That was a seminal paper actually produced in 2014 by Fingleton Associates and Open Data Institute in the UK. And that was used, uh, that was commissioned by the UK government to try and understand what would be the potential role um, for data access in the business. And it would solve for many of the problems that you see, not just in the UK banking sector in terms of non-competition, um, but also across many other industries, right? So more data, um, access would mean that you, you do indeed end up with more transparency for consumers in terms of pricing and quality of products, but also lower switching costs and lower barriers to entry. So it's quite important, and that's why it has been seen as a remedy by uh, financial services regulators and competition authorities uh, to try and not um, to stabilize and introduce integrity to the market, because this is one of the things that regulators need to do, but to apply competition, to, to inject more competition and have better and more fair outcomes for consumers. So this is kind of the logic. And sometimes, uh, you know, these are two mandates that uh, regulators have and can be in conflict, but um, if done, I guess, correctly, there are ways to, to go around new regulations that increase competition and fairness to consumers, but still ensure stability and integrity. And that has been, you know, constant kind of challenge. And there are plenty of examples around implementation of PSD2 across all countries in the EU, but also the UK equivalent, which is the open banking, where we have collected a lot of evidence of how this kind of struggle uh, takes place. Now, um, lack of competition has been documented in other studies as well. I'm not gonna kind of go through and cover pretty much everything, but 
uh, essentially without investing in, in more innovation, uh, you, you don't have um, uh, competition and uh, benefits to consumers and lack of innovation and investment in innovation has been again documented by the studies using OECD data um, the last kind of um, uh, five or so years. Uh, be happy to follow up on some of these um, papers um, if you want to. Now, um, obviously APIs is one of the technologies that has been suggested a lot um, in terms of data sharing in financial services. There are certain characteristics around security and standards that uh, fit the bill, for example. And there is a, a variation of, uh, of openness where you can kind of introduce them to the market uh, to, to start with in terms of data sharing, right? So we have closed APIs, uh, that have been used extensively in the past that are private, uh, potentially within organizations. But then if you move to the left or your right of your um, screen, or the right of your screen, you have kind of more openness being introduced in terms of accessibility. So this is one of the frameworks that was uh, actually took that from um, um, uh, European banking authorities in 2016, one um, of the papers kind of discussing PSD2. I, I went a step further and they introduced a different framework as I was uh, uh, trying to take part in the Canadian consultation last year and the year before. Uh, and I kind of proposed many different dimensions of API openness. So it's not just API accessibility that tells us how, how accessible the data are and, and uh, who, who has access uh, to the APIs that uh, you know they can consume the data, but also in terms of functionality, what categories of financial data can be shared through these APIs and, and what kind of services do they offer within that particular context, right? It could be payments, could be accounts, could be access to lending information or credit overall and so on and so forth. And then you have uses, right? Even if you decide on to who gets to access what and what kind of data, um, how much of these data can be consumed? What's the bandwidth? Uh, how these um, um, you know, data can be communicated through these APIs? And then other levels of openness include, for example, uh, in terms of the standards, openness of standards um, of, of these APIs. And, and that goes in terms of both data. So you can use, for example, standardized uh, data formats like ISO 20022, um, or uh, in terms of security standards and so on and so, and so forth. Um, and of course, lastly, I guess, is alternative APIs that can diversify data and technology, right? So incorporate uh, further data um, that could be matched to existing data uh, from financial services that uh, concern this particular kind of person. How open a system or infrastructure around data sharing, even in a particular industry, would be to incorporating other data assets um, uh, for this particular kind of individual or customer or business, right? So this is quite an important point because uh, data aggregation, data enrichment is one of the most fundamental uh, things if you think that data are assets and can be leveraged for further monetization of business models. So that has further implications for business models. And talking about business models, one of the things we have seen uh, through API and data sharing and data openness in the sector is that we're moving to different models and situations for economic activity. We have what we call the unbundling of the bank, a lot of fintechs kind of are doing similar things that banks are doing to models like bank as a platform where a bank or a centralized kind of financial institution, let's say centralized as in kind of having a central um, uh, place in the ecosystem and uh, one that can accumulate around it an ecosystem of third party players. Uh, and act as a platform into more of a rim bundling and um, you know different kind of approaches to value chains uh, within financial services. So these are things and changes into business models that we have observed and have published at least a couple papers on these in book chapters. So there's one forthcoming now again through the Swift Institute, which has funded our research uh, quite generously over the past five or six years where we're looking data sharing frameworks in finance. Uh, but also there's another book uh, coming up with MIT Press, a uh, book chapter in, in one of the FinTech books uh, coming up around open banking and data sharing business models. Um, now, APIs, of course, you know, they can be seen um, as technologies to share data, but conceptually you can think you know, following kind of the business um, uh, model, I guess, argument, they, they can be thought of as products themselves, right? So these are products that can be priced, they can be monetized, they can be marketed and sold on to people, and uh, they can be conceived as boundary resources, as bridges where an organization can reach out 
to the outside world and, and grab data, as I said, from different industries. And one of the big implications of digital economy is the blending between industries. So there's no uh, necessarily, uh, or at least maybe in the next 10, 20 years, we're not gonna be talking about industries in the same way we've been talking so far. So blending the boundaries between industries and organizations, is a big theme also in the management strategy and economics literature as well. And last but not least, they can be seen also as contracts. So they have legal implications because when you sign up and use a particular API, you subscribe to certain terms and conditions around it, right? So it's very good tools in, in, in interfacing um, actually to start with. And that, you know, obviously can shift people's thinking around, um, again, business models, thinking of uh, financial institutions as uh, institutions where they change the character of money, you know, making it uh, from, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of deposits into lending capital, for example, and they bank on money, let's say, to banking on data. So they, in the future, they can be more uh, be seen as data brokers where they monetize these um, integrations that they have with the outside world and manage data. That, that might be kind of the, the major kind of attribute uh, going forward as financial institutions. And within that, again, uh, part of the two papers I explained before, we kind of analyze or try and understand how openness at the different levels of the architecture of the organization can affect the business model and the monetization of these relationships. And we have platform business models, which some of you may already know, they have certain characteristics that fit um, this situation that we're moving into, the more increased data sharing we have, the more banks can think of new ways to monetize uh, relationships and data. And, um, uh, you know, we have the emergence of the bank as a platform, for example, where you have a central hub that doesn't necessarily produce uh, solutions and services, but can link people to, to solutions to services in a, in a very kind of personalized um, and creative way, for example, right? So these are kind of variety of business models we see in one of these papers, we're actually discussing the different variations. Um, some of them are academic papers, obviously, um, may not everybody have access to, but certainly there is, I think, white paper equivalents we have out there. Um, so other implications, and if you extend that argument to business models and platforms into innovation ecosystems, again, there is a lot of literature there about industry architecture um, and innovation bottlenecks that uh, one can experience. If you think that, uh, for example, um, you know, a company is not going to be doing everything themselves anymore and will rely on third parties for uh, certain parts of the value chain and propositions that they put forward to the consumer, one of the key strategic uh, things that they have to look out for is how to manage uncertainty across the entire value chain, not in their immediate relationships, but the second tier and th third tier relationships that they have. There's a long literature, both in management strategy and economics as well, around innovation bottlenecks in these kind of arrangements. And again, we have another paper, hopefully will be published this year or uh, early next year around um, innovation bottlenecks within innovation ecosystems in financial services. Now, this has been at the firm level, but we're also as economists, obviously, and this is where it links more to competition, we're interested in what is the impact of data sharing frameworks and, and, and openness you know, through APIs, for example, or even screen scraping uh, in the industry as a whole. And we have noticed that the industry is becoming more and more modular. You know, it's becoming more modularized. And we have this modular architecture that is being identified. And this means that in a previously to kind of environment where we had a lot of siloed uh, systems or well, legacy systems kind of more vertically integrated organizations and institutions um, pretty much trying to do everything themselves. We're kind of moving now with data sharing to more distributed or modular kind of environment where for any given service that a consumer uh, adopts or, or, or uses, there's a variety of organizations in the back that play a role in, in shaping up this product or service and making it into something that can be consumed in the end. Now, again, this has certain implications if you think about innovation bottlenecks, but at the policy level, you need to think about how do you regulate, again, these relationships, right? And this is exactly where one could point to uh, debates around whether you regulate data openness in the market or whether you just leave it up to the market to establish these um, um, kind of best practice uh, inter interactions, right? Um, and this is again, you know, one of the things that we have been discussing in, across in different countries, um, 
but also kind of be can be very relevant within different and across different industries, right? So, um, where do you re regulate and what do you leave it up to the market to uh, kind of decide? And in terms of uh, you know uh, thinking with a policy hat on, uh, I should say, you know, there are different themes that uh, identified in that particular kind of paper. Uh, it's a policy paper about data sharing frameworks in financial services I came to author uh, just last year in August, 2020, which came um, um, as part of the consultation that happened in Canada. And I was, I happened to be a visiting professor at Ivy Business School at that point in time uh, at Western University in Ontario. And I kind of informally took part in the consultation and also had a lot of interactions with uh, the Department of Finance and other regulators, but also industry practitioners, fintechs and banks and so on and so forth. So the, so, you know, identified three big themes and within that the implementation theme was obviously the larger because there's several issues in there. Um, but to start with, one would need to identify what are the objectives uh, of, uh, of the data sharing um, uh, potential regulation. So for example, is, is it been done from the perspective of competition? Do you need to boost competition in your economy or is it just about being fair to the consumer and recognize and acknowledge that um, you know, the, their data belongs to them and, and so give them more flexibility to, uh, to mobilize their data you know, uh, in terms of data portability across uh, different entities or even industries. And, um, and give them more, more freedom, let's say, right? So these different approaches, if you look at the Australian model, for example, the regulation around data opens came from the consumers, um, you know, protection kind of authorities. But if you look at, um, or for example, the EU or and definitely the UK came from the competition and markets authority. So the entire idea was to boost more competition. It doesn't mean that obviously the customer would not benefit because I think, you know, obviously that was part of the agenda overall, but, but it's quite important to identify the objective in order to see where the regulation or the framework would come from. And then of course the approach, whether you would actually do that as a policy or let it out to the market. Again, there's different kind of approaches. If we see the US so far has been driving it at the market level, but there is evidence that things are not necessarily working. And there is uh, one of the, um, um, uh, you know, authorities right now are looking at the effectiveness of data sharing and whether it needs to be regulated. So this is a discussion that will open up in the next few months, hopefully. Uh, so that's theme one, and then theme two, uh, uh, an umbrella uh, kind of uh, of, of uh, issues around accountability. Uh, so that you need to decide, um, you know, around liability issues and why the relevant data privacy laws that tap into this kind of data sharing and mobility and transfer um, um, of, of data assets, for example, across uh, different entities. And this is to say that obviously. Uh, again, you, you need to see what are the relevant data privacy laws, whether they cover some of that aspect in the fin finance industry or any industry you're looking to regulate data sharing, uh, or if you need to be more specific around the liability issues that are being created between people and organizations as they move data around. So this is like another theme I've identified. And the last thing I identified is around implementation, which I think is the more is the trickiest one. And, and that's also, we see a bit of variation um, in terms of how things are implemented going forward. The UK has chosen, for example, a very specific way to do it. So they raised an implementation entity to do exactly that. And they responded to some of these challenges I'm gonna present now, but it's not always the case that it's, it's it will have to be like that, right? So um, for example, in terms of identifying and deciding on, on data openness, um, again, uh, uh, you know, what types of data you access and permission that needs to be decided, how it's gonna be implemented exactly. Uh, in terms of data identity or identification of the third parties, um, again, this will need to be decided. How do you identify yourself, uh, you know, uh, as in customer authorization, for example, but also how do you identify kind of third parties who are keen to access this data? Is there a licensing system that you, uh, that you use in order to give uh, uh, access? Uh, then in terms of API adoption and standards, again, if you look at the UK model, very specific through OBIE, creating all the standards for um, certain organizations to use. Um, for some, they have it open, so they can kind of adopt any anything that uh, they want. For smaller towns of banks, for example, there's no mandate to use a particular standard, but for bigger banks, or what we call in the UK, the CMA9, they have to use a particular standard. So that was deliberately done that way. 
Um, in terms of data standards, as I said, you know, OBI is adopting the ISO 2022 model. Then you have issues around security, again, around authorization, authentication standards, and permission frameworks. Um, data standards I mentioned. And then you need to think how all these new infrastructure that you're implementing to share data, how it taps into existing infrastructure. And one of the big debates in financial services sector that is very well linked to PSD2 and open banking as a whole is access to payment systems, right? And that will dictate whether and how and what kind of data you should open up, right? So if you have very good access to payment system, maybe, um, you know, opening up or giving access to, to uh, payment initiation um, data may not be necessarily kind of something um, uh, that uh, needs to be demanded, right? So again, you, you'd need to see where you stand as a jurisdiction in terms of access. So this is, um, you know, kind of the, the framework I provided. You can find it freely available online and you can go and follow that reference. Um, this is just the decisions that the uh, the UK model has, has made. I'm not gonna take them uh, through uh, too much of a detail. And is you can see quite a bit of variation across different countries. And I think I'm, I'm gonna stop here. I hope this is um, useful in terms of um, uh, feeding into the next debate that we'll have in the panel and, and obviously to the conversation so far about uh, data share. Matthew, over yes, to you. Thank you, thank you Marcos. We still have uh, one or two minutes for, for questions here. Uh, oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Is that, would you think that if at least for example, PSD2 was not API driven regulation, we would have seen as much investment and enthusiasm by let's say the entrepreneur innovative ecosystem and investors about the ability to uh, to invest into FinTech, right? Yeah, oh, wow, that, that's a very good question. It's hard to measure what is the impact. Is I think it's hard enough to measure what is the actual impact of PSD2 right now on the market. And I think that was also mentioned as a big question by um, other people previously. I think maybe Monica kind of alluded to it. I wish we had the data. And as economists, we are urgently asking access to data. And since the, um, uh, the uh, um, Urban Commission people are here, can collaborate on something like that, it would be good to have some evidence of what PSD2 regulation is doing to the market. I think it's even harder to speculate what the counterfactual would be, what you know the industry would be like so far if it wasn't mandated. I think a lot of things wouldn't have happened. You know, that's my perception by looking at other jurisdictions that haven't forced this and haven't translated that into policy. Um, you know, for example, the US is not kind of really progressing rapidly. There's certain organizations that are adopting kind of more openness, but still, you know, the market is quite big and there's resistance and there is again, um, uh, but, but also I think in the US is quite unique market because of the federal kind of arrangement they have. They have kind of many regional banks which operate in a totally different kind of um, uh, approach in terms of financial inter intermediation. But still, I mean, if you look at other jurisdictions, I think it's hard to convince the industry to move something to something new, which is so radically different. Because data openness in the in the way PSD two imposes it across the European Union is very radically different. We're actually doing a new paper right now at Alliance Monster Business School with a couple of professors in finance, trying to study this relationship. So we are using a. Um, uh, event study approach to try and see what has been the impact of PSD2. But again, this is kind of more publicly accessible, um, uh, you know, data, and and we'll, we'll we'll just have to see what the data say in the end. But it's going to be very interesting. More more refined data would be even better. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, totally uh, to understand. And it's true that someone sometimes I talk to investors and I say, look, yeah, what uh, GDPR is bringing to the personal data tech market what PSD2 bring to the fintech market, right? So then, uh, you know, these investors go look at platforms and say, look, yeah, but does it really work, the portability, GDPR portability, right, for us to believe in the world where data will be more liquid and so will be, will be really shared and the value will be shared. So it's a, it's a discussion we have a, we have a lot, right, uh, there. And we have, we'll take a second question from Haluk in, in Amnis. Is there a need for licensing new fintechs in EU to act as accredited data recipient like in Australia, to your mind? Yeah, um, I think that that could be a possibility. I think um, in terms of the licensing 
kind of framework, uh, you know, for, for PSD2, there's clear uh, definitions for AISPs and PISPs. Now, if there is need for uh, a new bridge of fintechs um, that would act as accredited data recipients, like this random model, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. One would need to study, you know, the existing kind of uh, regulations, even kind of GDPR and how that kind of covers quite a, quite a lot of the liabilities that we, data liabilities we have right now across Europe um, and the EU. So um, I, I'm not sure I can give an answer to that, I'm afraid. Uh, but this is pretty good. I think I'll, I'll just follow up on that and see if I can um, come up with something and happy yeah. to connect, Haluk. Thank you, Haluk. Uh, you made research uh, go forward. Thanks to your question. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, there. So, Marcos, thank you very much. Uh, don't hesitate to provide the link where we can follow your research or support your research, right, in, in the chat to everybody, uh, right? So, really, uh, don't hesitate and stay with us also for, you know, commenting or at least uh, arguing with us on the next uh, and last part of this, of this event, which will be a panel with Mark Boyd, Tyler Singletary, and Keen Lane about API neutrality. Thank you very much, Marcos, for being there with us. Uh, so, Mark and Tyler, and Ken, are you with us? Yep, hey, Mehdi, and hey, all of the speakers and uh, everyone in the audience. Um, I'm Mark Boyd, I use the pronouns he and him. Um, really fantastic series of speakers that really laid out the, um, uh, the examples today. So looking forward to our chat. Hello there. Yeah, hello, Ken. Hello, my friends. Yeah, hello. Nice to see you. It's early in in uh, in uh, in the Silicon Valley here. Thank you for being with us. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we need to present you any uh, anymore, but uh, so I propose you do it for yourself. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Um, my name's Ken Lane. I'm a chief evangelist at Postman. Uh, some folks might also know me as the API evangelist. Uh, I study uh, the the business, the technology, and and the politics of of APIs uh, for the last, oh gosh, I guess it's going on 11 years now. So yeah, since 2010. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being with us. Uh, can we mention also, because uh, we have a lot of policymakers in the audience today, thanks to the European Commission uh, Research uh, Center, uh, that you've been also a former Presidential Innovation Fellow on APIs under Barack Obama administration. Can yeah, sorry, I, I'm horrible at selling myself like, yeah, I worked in the Obama administration doing data policy uh, as, a, as a presidential innovation fellow, helping uh, agencies uh, use APIs to open up their data after President Obama uh, mandated that all federal agencies need to go machine readable by default. And this work continues, I continued through the, the last administration, but we're, we're pretty excited for, for new leadership change and, and hopefully some, some more good stuff's coming. Yeah, thank you, Ken. And last but not least, we have a Tyler Singletary with us. Maybe Tyler, can you give some words about, about you? Of course, uh, I'm Tyler Singletary. Uh, I've been working in the API space for nearly a decade. Um, uh, I work primarily in social media related platform APIs, uh, and I'm the COO and uh, head of product for a company called Tagboard that works with a number of third party APIs from um, social networks, as well as uh, has its own API. And then previously I was at Clout that did much the same sort of thing. Uh, in terms of uh, its uh, interoption, uh, interoperability with APIs from Facebook and Twitter and hosting its own API, but very different as a business. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. So, so just to uh, set up the stage, and again, don't hesitate to ask your question in the chat or in the question and answer aspect. So, during the this uh, uh, this event, we we had uh, we talk about the current policies, at least in Europe, pushing for more uh, data, better data governance, especially data portability, right? So we've seen with uh, François Xavier uh, Cao uh, in his uh, PhD that he showed that on GDPR portability, the fact there is no direct mention about how to make the data portable, just you have to share machine readable data in the format you want, the way you want uh, during in 30, in, under 30 days. 
right? So it's really not well technically specif specified. We've seen that a lot of companies are finding many loopholes to not respect it, in, at least in the spirit, right? Some companies provide an automatic takeout, which is a which is kind of there is an, an endpoint API somewhere, <laughs> right? But they don't provide it as is to be to make portability programmable. So the question here is that what's fair between making API available and accessible, at least for users themselves, to enforce their right of portability? You know, just to uh, remind that GDPR regulation is really at least the way it has been designed. It's really on the top of regulation, right, in Europe. So it goes beyond like term of services or, or stuff like that. But in the same time, how we can respect platforms investments, uh, platforms, uh, uh, let's say uh, work, and let's say platform value that is, that, that is generated by, uh, you know, providing a service and providing, let's say, uh, links or providing graphs to users, enabling them to actually do more, most of the time for free. So where do you find the limit with the right of portability versus the right of, uh, you know, uh, make doing business, uh, doing business in a way when you deliver value to others? So this is the concept of API neutrality. And just to finish the context, the, the, the first time it was coined, it was in 2006 in a book by Jonathan Zitran, who is professor of law at Harvard University, who said, yeah, like net neutrality, we, we should have API neutrality. We should let everybody access to APIs in the same way without, let's say, di uh, discrimination. So same quality of service, same level of access for everybody, even competitors, right? That would be beneficial for the market. But again, this would... Uh, uh, would benefit small players, but that would not protect maybe investment of actors that need some, uh, as uh, Peter Thiel say, local and timely monopolies to be able to fund their growth, right? And some companies who have been there, uh, like that are big now, let's say there are a lot of users because people love the, what they do. So where do we can find that limit? So uh, I, I know, Mark, uh, that you fight a lot for equal opportunities. Uh, in the physical world and the online world, what's your thinking about it, Mark? I believe in. I believe that any any company, startup or large enterprise that is going to be collecting personal data should have a API neutrality requirement to make that um, data available to all of their users um, via an API. So I don't. I don't. I think the commoditization of building APIs has come down low enough that that's not a burden on top of um, their, their work. That if you want to actually be uh, a, a business that's responsible for collecting personal data, that you have, a, you have a responsibility to make that data accessible, at least back to the user that's been contributing that data via API. And I think, uh, and it's a bit, and then at a, a government level, it's like the work that Kim was doing where um, when he was a presidential fellow and it's about each government has then an API neutrality um, sort of principle around making the data that they're collecting available as um, uh, machine readable data um, so that it can be shared and be used as a resource uh, across government uh, departments, but then also with wider society. So I, I think that should be a minimum. I think for the, the main thing with that is the portability requirement. So it's about having that, so that the user of the data should be able to get their, their data back. And I think Francois Xavier's um, presentation was fantastic as well as, as far as showing that the GDR, GDPR principle just isn't working in practice, you know, um, and that, that there's still a, a number of barriers there. So I would say that, and actually it ties back to Nestor's presentation as well around um, the Data Governance Act and the data strategy. And he and in the Data Governance Act, it actually is trying to set up a whole range of different controls for how data should be shared. And if you, in order to avoid um, sorry, I'll finish on this point. Uh, uh, in order to avoid value extraction risks, where um, a US company, for example, is collecting data on European citizens and then building things in the US, aren't contributing any um, digital taxes to a European country, but are building something that they're then selling into Europe. And then so there's, so European citizens are sort of used as the raw data elements for this but there's no benefit back to um, uh, local economies. And I think some of the provisions of the Data Governance Act is trying to address that 
And I think API neutrality would be a really simple way to just do that. So yeah, thank but, you, Mark, and for continuing the discussion. I'll ask maybe Tyler. You've been working on for platforms, you know, helping them uh, to, to grow and understand uh, their users and the right provide more value to users. What's your feeling when you hear that everything should be open and neutral and actually all the maybe the rewards of the good investment, the good product design should be shared even with competitors? What, what, what do you feel with that? I think there has to be a lot more nuance than just open good and closed bad, um, particularly depending on what sector we're talking about, what sort of data they have on users and even like the level of granularity um, that is shared. If we think about a lot of, especially in the social media space, um, a lot of the APIs aren't about the relationship between the platform and the user necessarily. Um, they're often about the ecosystem at large, sharing information between them to further strengthen either the offering to individual users or to further strengthen the platform itself. So you could imagine that, um, let, let's use Twitter as an example. Twitter offers an API that provides um, the tweets themselves, the content that users are creating. That absolutely should be available to those individual users to be able to export out of there. They also create edge data, um, edge data of let's say like the relationships, the follower graph, um, the likes, uh, actions that people take, but also actions that they don't take. Um, that stuff arguably should also be available via API, um, but should it be portable? That's a, a different question. But then when you think about how a company, a third party company, let's say um, a company that does analytics on top of uh, that data, is that data then also need to be exported to those users? And does the platform need to provide the down level data to the users or does each individual processor of that data need to offer that data to those users? Um, if we take that a little bit further and think about innovation and stifling innovation there, um, I think I did a talk a while back about like the table stakes investment required to build on top of a lot of these platforms. The more requirements that we put for API portability into it, the more investment is required in order to actually deliver a useful service to them. And I know that APIs are, are almost table stakes now and it's very easy to provide those to individual users, but we're just adding kind of to the required stack and thus the required amount of money that any of these startups need to have on board in order to even offer or innovate or build services on top of any of these platforms. Um, the competitive side, I think is less of a risk. Um, there was a time 10 years ago, 15 years ago when you know Facebook and Twitter as an example were in heavy competition with each other obviously with Instagram Twitter started blocking you know the uh, rendering of content on Instagram because Instagram was stealing the social graph from Twitter or something to that effect um, I think we have evolved a bit now to where we understand that each of these platforms is not a winner takes all strategy necessarily they all provide different value to different areas and I think we're gonna actually see that the interoperability between those becomes more and more of a, uh, an allowed thing. Um, but I, I think like the interoperability uh, has to start and stop at a certain spot. Um, should Twitter make available all the likes data and all their edge data to Instagram in order for Instagram to make use of that? Probably not. Should a user be able to export their Twitter data that includes those edges and then bring that into Instagram as the individual user? Probably not. And uh, who is going to be the arbiter of, uh, is, a, is a like on Twitter equal to a heart on Instagram? And if those were portable, are those going to translate to being the same kind of data element? And if we reduce everything to being the same data elements across services, have we reduced the overall value of any of those individual services? Um, I'll stop there, but uh, a, a lot of this stuff comes to mind, uh, uh, particularly working in a company that tries to equalize a lot of these sort of pieces of content and actions 
in some way that's universal and knowing full well they are not universal. Yeah, thank you for bringing uh, the real complexity. Sometimes we believe too, it's too much binary, uh, open, close, or allowed or for, forbidden. Thank you for bringing how complex it is to find the right, the right uh, uh, limit. And, and Kin, you know, you've been uh, you know, adv advocating APIs for companies, for governments, for nonprofits, for uh, people, right? Uh, so what do you think about the right limit there? Well, I mean, first, first off, you know, data portability, it's a, it's a common tactic for companies to make that. Yes, you can get it out, but getting it used anywhere else, getting it imported, um, you know, I don't know how many takeout systems I've used where I've got a big download, I've got all my data, but I'm not viewing it. I'm not going to use it anywhere. It's not portable in any way. So I think we have to unpack what portability means because there's there's certain aspects of portability that you know a common schema a common interface for accessing that data um there's there's a lot that needs to be figured out there um but yeah i'm a big fan of it um i and i would say uh you know regulation mandating it is the only way it's going to happen the providers are really good at saying you know my user data my whatever these resources that you're mandating i put forward are my, my secret sauce, my proprietary. It's what makes me unique. You know, it's what Mark Zuckerberg argued in front of Congress saying, you know, we don't have any competitors. So we can't be a monopoly. You know, we're, we're, we're a special snowflake. And uh, because our data, what we do is so special. And I think that's what most companies are gonna, gonna wanna argue if they're not mandated. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for mandating. And then I would put it back on, on API, on, on anybody who's who's ma being mandated to to put forth the takeout system that speaks a common vocabulary uh, that it you know it's an API it's a new data point it's a new endpoint for you to gather intelligence like what what applications what software are is pull, pulling information from those those takeout systems universally across all the takeout systems there's an opportunity there for awareness and 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 kind of uh, getting ahead of the game and understanding what's going on with your competitors so if your competitors are are being forced to put forth some information and so are you i mean that's an opportunity if you're you know if you've fully embraced api you get api management and the awareness that that that, that kind of reporting brings at that level and then what's got to be shared out in the commons across these takeout systems, that's an opportunity. And I'll, you know, speak to from my learnings from, from Tyler, he, you know, he's a wise soul taught me years ago that constraints are good, API constraints are good. And I would put that back on providers that, hey, regulatory constraints can be good, can be an opportunity um, if you see it that way. If you don't, um, and you're gonna be in a bad way in coming years because regulations coming across the board in many sectors. I mean, the US is gearing up, whether it's it's financial um, and, and mimicking uh, PSD2 like things uh, for the CFPB right now, rules are coming there. Healthcare, it's coming. Uh, the Department of Justice, you know, is looking into Facebook. Um, regulations are coming. We, so you're better off embracing it, being agile and being API first and all of that and seeing it as an opportunity and, and working within those constraints rather than fighting it. So brace yourselves, regulations are coming. <laughs> this is this is this is how it happens. I will go a little bit more controversial here, and I'll start by, by you, Mark. Uh, uh, here, so we really understand that. Okay, for you, it should be like almost a fundamental right, you know, API neutrality, everybody to access. But there is a great uh, paper called "Return on Data" by uh, lawyers and researcher Noam Colt, who just claim something simple. They say, look, as long as users use the service for free, right? At some point, they provide the data. Uh, they they consider as they use the service for free, they consider the data they give away value less than the service, the value of the service that is provided to them. So at some point, you know, the the the, the capture of the data and the capture of the APIs to not be released in, on neutrality is actually the right of the the decision of the user itself, right? If because if when for example we see the average revenue of a Facebook user is thirty dollars. 152 for an American user, people may, may, may consider that the value of the service is more than $12 a month, at least American users. So at some point, yeah, it's okay if the API is not directly portable, API is not directly uh, usable because they have a service or in many businesses or people want to keep a relationship with friends 
and value that a lot more than twelve dollars a month. Would 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 it be fair to consider uh, this that way? Sure. I mean, I don't I, like. I think so, but I think the problem is it's all of the information asymmetry that you that we're talking about as well with APIs. And I th and this is what I love about Kin's last comment about raising awareness. Like that's fine if that's what people decide, but they're not. We don't have enough of a discussion about data literacy to be able to for people to understand the value of their data to be able to have that sort of nuance or the granularity that. Tyler is suggesting about where the that needs a community discussion in all of this and we're unable to have that as a community because we don't like there were some good models um I love some of Marcus's stuff around the um PSD2 there's a group in Belgium that's just now going wider um to most of Europe called um Cake and they've got a revenue sharing model so people can see the data value that they've got so if you link your bank to Cake which is a budgeting app and it's got discounts and loyalty and all of that sort of stuff. Um, you're sharing your aggregated banking transactional data. So you're spending data, but that's anonymized, but you're sharing that with Cake so that they can give you your savings app budget planning. But in addition, Cake then bundles that from all of their users and sells it to a, a, a um, enterprise that wants to understand spending behaviors for a particular demographic. And then Cake keeps 50% of the money that they make from that deal. And they share the other 50% with all of the Cake users. So each Cake user gets three or four euros back a month at the moment. So if you're, so, you know, like, so you're immediately seeing the value of your data. So it's, a, it's sort of hard to believe that Facebook is only worth, what did you say, 30 bucks? <laughs> no, but, but, so the, revenue, the revenues they make in average per user, the revenues according to you know, the, the investors and then the number seat, right, is $30 per user. It goes up to 150 per year per user in, in North America. This is the revenues yeah. they, they make, right? But again, this is the revenue they make now, right? But as we saw, as we say, shared in the report, the market capitalization of a user, so the lifetime value in the US is $1,300. So it's a, it's, it's a little bit more. They consider that the market considers that they will monetize at least $1,300 a user on their lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I think we need more discussion around, you know, that data literacy. I mean, for me, so for me, for example, originally I was a Spotify premium user and it was, I was fine with putting my uh, was for paying my Spotify because they were using my data to give me discovery playlists, which I loved, you know? So that was fantastic. The issue is that Spotify then started giving large sums of money to Joe Rogan, who's like anti-trans, um, uh, anti-mask. So I was like, I don't want to be involved with that. So I deleted my Spotify account, but it took me two months to try to move my Spotify playlists to Tidal. And then so, and this is core to me. I've, I've got music on all day, you know, while I'm working. So um, this is so for me, there was a really high value in all of this. The API service I used has been shut down by Spotify. So they don't allow now that data portability. There will be no way. I was lucky in that window to move it across. Otherwise, I would lose all my playlists from Spotify. But so there is a so suddenly the data portability and the value of my data becomes really clear to me, you know, and like so it's almost and I mean I think people understand it. Like when the when you suddenly couldn't um have your likes in or you couldn't have photos from I think it was Instagram into Twitter, people complained about that. So they're complaining about the API access. Like people will understand if you start, if we start talking about that, but we haven't had those data literacy conversations just yet. Yeah, that totally understand. But at some point, you know, when we go in a grocery, are we always informed of all what we buy, all everything is produced, you know, it's, it's a, it's a limit that we try to understand, you know, to inform the user. Well, under the Green New Deal, a uh, Green Deal in Europe, they are actually bringing in product um, uh, uh, product uh, information that you can see the full circular economy cost of the product from production through to how much the waste is going to do. And um, I think Kim's involved in or has been certainly a support player in um, supporting the uh, product passport information. So that's available again by API. Is that right, Kim? Yeah, I mean, just because the average person's not going to care about these things, I think that's an easy argument. We should be able to scratch and dig at these and, and understand this. And they should be auditable and 
uh, you know, uh, independent parties should be able to, you know, look at this stuff and understand what's going on. So yeah, it's, it's, I think it's easy. I think it's a common tech thing for us to say, oh, don't worry about this. This is really complicated stuff. It just happens behind the scenes. Don't think about it. And it's a, it's an easy way to obfuscate things. Uh, and, and we say it may be under intellectual property or, you know, com, you know, it, it's our, it's our competitive edge, but usually in my experience, it's just covering up incompetency and, and other things going on, laziness and people not wanting to, uh, to show what's actually going on behind the scenes. I, yeah, I think I definitely agree with that point of view on it because, uh, I mean, companies are incentivized not to make that stuff available and they're incentivized to present the argument of um, it's too complicated and we can move on. But the uh, Mark's Spotify argument is actually a really good example um, to kind of work off of because it, it embodies the concept that a play playlist itself is a portable concept that me creating a playlist in an application is something that therefore should be portable and move somewhere else. Um, and my content creation there that is based on the linkage of the things that they make available to me there uh, is an element that I should be able to export and then import somewhere else and allow that. And if we kind of take some of that concept further, like that one I can sort of understand, but it's an amazing uh, world that we live in now that, um, you know, basic entertainment things that we enjoy are things that we're starting to expect there to be an API around. And uh, it, it, it starts to really think about the, the concept of mapping the world into these common objects that um, I, I would say, I know it's almost a slippery slope argument, but like, I'd, I'd be afraid that we're going to lose the magic. Uh, so if, all I'm doing on Spotify is making a playlist and that playlist is just a table of um, favorited tracks one way or another, then what is Spotify different than Tidal? Um, what is you know, that playlist different from uh, an album? What is, uh, you know, what is the unique offering that anything offers here? And maybe that kind of constraint means that there will be more innovation on Spotify if you could easily just move that to somewhere else. Um, but I think it almost misses the point that if we're focused on like these individual objects or collection of objects as being what has to be interoperable, um, then we're, um, we're kind of, we're not enabling those individual companies to really innovate in the right spots. Um, we'd want them to export their innovating aspects, not their common aspects, because unless they could also export um, maybe the, the, the little uh, dial that they put next to a track that shows me how popular that track is on Spotify, that's a unique Spotify element. Now, should they have to export that as well um, as it's related to my usage of it? Um, if I'm getting value from that dial being there, shouldn't I be able to take that dial somewhere else? And of course I can make a screenshot, but um, yeah, it's just a, it's all, always an interesting concept because uh, the, the levels that we move in detail of from banking, which all of us do and all of us have money and all of us need to manage that down to music where all of us, yes, do that, but it's more of a, a consumerist kind of activity. Um, I, I have to wonder where we focus our attention first, or do we do it everywhere all the time just because APIs happen to exist right now? Yeah, and, and again, Tyler, you, you had this cap table, cap table you know, of in the investment needed to reach critical mass. You know, uh, for at least personally, like, like 100 million of users, I'm happy of a Google search. I'm happy of uh, finding friends on Facebook and keeping relationship. I'm happy to follow people on Twitter. And, 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 I'm, and I'm really happy on many platforms that were actually the, the critical mass, uh, right? And, and it has been funded to actually make the service worth, really worth it, right? And so if we provide APIs, we, you know, complete neutral in, in, in a way that delivers value, you know, diverse the value and make no competitive edge, we don't keep at least some value in these platforms to continue to innovate if they innovate, right? Of course. 
So, but where, where would be the limit? And I would just ask you to think about a proposal. You know, uh, for example, when you ask your data to a platform as a user, you get less data that if you build an app and you require data for an API, right? So maybe we just find a trade-off by just asking, okay, if you are just a lone user, right? You can ask as much as you would give to a third party, right? So at least portability for the user itself. Would you, would you agree to kind of stuff like that? Generally, yes. Uh, I'd say that a lot of the API platforms make data available in their API differently than they might, might make available in portability because there is an implicit financial benefit relationship in the ecosystem that I'm giving you access to this data and you are going to build a company that delivers value back to me. If I am a platform and I'm offering data portability to an individual on par with what I'm offering to another company that's going to make me more revenue, um, I'd have to know that that individual is going to provide me the same level of opportunity. Uh, I don't actually agree with this, but you know, like I'm trying to think through the way that you would um, rationalize this is if, let's, let's use Facebook as an example, if me as a user is only worth $20 to Facebook and they need to make available an API to me, well, that's only worth up to $20 for them to make that available to me. But if I'm to uh, be working in an API with a marketing services company that uh, ends up being the uh, company that $2 billion a year of ad spend is running through, I can be pretty sure that I'm gonna make available a lot more to that 2 billion in ad spend that's going to flow through my company, even though in some way it's uh, part of the enabling of the $20 that uh, I as an individual am worth. Just, just for a fun story, uh, in Europe, we have a, a law that called the uh, database regulation kind of, that enables you to, to request the data you provided as a database right to a third party. So I asked for myself to say, look, hey, Facebook, I actually, I gave you access. I, I filled your database with my data, right? So give me it, uh, give me it back. And the company can require you to pay for the value of the, the database, right? So I asked, you know, for the, say, okay, I can buy it back. Just tell me how, how much it's worth, right? <laughs> of course, they never answered to that. But we, we try to find a way to, for companies to say, look, yeah, you make $30 of you um, about with my data, I keep I pay you thirty dollars. Give me the full data in machine readable format to API access. Of course, they don't answer, but we we let's say there are ways where we can try to at least have the data back. And then my question goes maybe to Kin, like, okay, it's, it, it seems some companies or monopolies don't want to do it per directly themselves, but is it to governments maybe to show the path or public uh, sector? I mean. Yes, I mean, I think you can see the evidence of this in any other more mature sector. Um, regulation comes, I'm sorry, we're, we're, I know we dominate the landscape right now in the tech sector, but we're, we're still in our infancy. We're still, you know, when you look at the, the energy space, when you look at the automobile, you look at the others, regulation's coming. I mean, it's coming and it's gonna be full force. You're, we're, it's, we're gonna have a lot of uh, ways that governments are gonna get involved in dictating how technology can and can't be used. But I would say, yes, that's important, that's relevant and, and you, businesses need to prepare for that. Um, but what, you know, just listening to you and Tyler talk, you know, the thing that bothers me about this is we're, we're, we're still talking about this, like this is all valuable. It's worth, 30, I'm worth $30 on Facebook. No, that's not, this is me. I'm not for sale. I'm sorry. This is me, me and my friends in public places physically. It, you know, I may be drinking, with, you know, I've drank with all of you around the world, you know, in a bar, you know, that the, the value of that is not just in the drinks. The value of that is, is in us and, and me. And we, we can't keep putting price tags on these things. You know, we got to look at it in, in terms of, of, of this being human beings and where, where the, val the value being, not monetarily, you know, this is people's relationship, these are people's lives. And I think if we keep framing it in terms of, of the value of myself and my data, all we're doing is just playing into the hands of, of you know, the markets. I, I agree with that. And I agree that, that 
governments need to regulate and that's like that's the way forward although trusting governments to understand appropriately and regulate appropriately is tough um, but I often think back to like creating the analog in real life and to use your example of us drinking around the world together and the pictures of us you know uh, at a conference or at a bar um, where did we used to put that uh, before Facebook you know you had a photo album and you kept that at home um, what did it take for me to get a copy of those photos do we each have our own photo book at home? Are they interchangeable? Do we all have the same photos of it? Um, does the, uh, does the, the photography mat or the, the, um, uh, you know, the, the pharmacy that I developed those photos, uh, do, did they have a responsibility to also make those photos available to you and uh, to identify us as people inside of them and ensure that everyone present um, also has that available to them in some way? No. Um, are we they over couldn't, applying? They couldn't sell your photos out the back door of the photo mat. True, but I wonder, I wonder if there actually was regulation that said that they couldn't do that. Um, I, don't, I don't know if they actually had a regulation that would have said, I delivered them, if we think about portability, I delivered them a canister of film. They printed on their paper the contents of that film when they developed the photos. That paper was still in their possession at that point in time. If they were able to make multiple copies of that and deliver it, like, is a photo still mine at that point? And I know copyright law covers this and the, the answer is yes, uh, it is still mine and they weren't able to do that. But um, we also didn't have an agreement with them at that point in time that says, I am signing over distribution rights to you Facebook the platform for anything that I put on here um, to make it available to others. Um, I don't know. It's, it's just always interesting to kind of try to back up to what the core action is and what the core materials are and how we would have operated with them without technology. Because then when we try to over apply technology to things that maybe don't need it, um, we start to run into these messes where we, we start to run up against walls that um, are virtually there, but wouldn't have been there otherwise, or we run through walls that are virtually not there, but otherwise in the real world would have been there. So maybe either a size, uh, either a specific size, just an example, Facebook in 2010 launched their graph APIs where actually you can share the friends list and, and in the friends list you share to an application, there's emails of the friends, right? So they can actually uh, access to it, completely not respecting at least some privacy rules. But at this point, I think Facebook went to 400 million users to 1.2 billion users in between 2010 and 2014, right? And in 2014, they said, okay, we stopped this. It's too much data, <laughs> too much data out. Okay, we stopped this. We have new restriction, but it was, it was over. When you, were, when you go from 400 millions to 1.2 billion, now you were too big to fail. And now you can enforce practice. Just example of Airbnb who were scraping Craigslist data uh, right for uh, having their uh, uh, specific um, uh, um, uh, posts, right? Uh, 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 apartment renting posts. But now Airbnb doesn't provide an open access to available uh, posts, right? So it seems like the business model of the opening is the closing at some point. And, and APIs are, are really key here. And, and, and the FCC the, 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 in the US, the regulation, uh, authority uh, actually said, if I in, can you share that? Yeah, Facebook used APIs as a monopoly, uh, as antitrust in antitrust behavior, right? So, is there a specific size where actually we say, okay, for now it's okay to not be neutral, but at some point when you are a monopoly, you should, right? Is there a size element to your mind? To, to me, there isn't, because if you look at um, one of the leading bride share companies that I think has been toxic from the very beginning, whenever you try to talk about their um, API, their platform. So for example, you talk about how they're coming into cities and they're now offering rideshare that's competitive to taxis, but they're not offering disability access services. And you are, and you say, oh no, you can't stop them from, um, you can't stop them with regulation now. You've got to let them grow and build up and be a viable business and then they can be regulated. So that was the argument at the beginning. They never actually then went around and got to the point where they've addressed 
accessibility, they may have done so in occasional cities where there's um, then the political need to do so, but it's not um, uniform across their um, platform. So then you still, and the same with Airbnb, Airbnb actually we're seeing restrictions here. I live in Barcelona and here we're actually, I think they're debating whether or not to even ban Airbnb completely because of the um, housing affordability issues that they've created. But the, but like there isn't, but uh, these sorts of things, uh, and I go, I think it goes to Tyler's point of like, they're not, the governments aren't very good at regulating this. So the, so then they, they're not, um, so then that the answer is like, let's hold off until we see where technology leads us. And then technology ends up leading us down a Facebook white supremacist road. And then it's like too late to pull back from all of that. So like, you know, like I think you do actually need to start small, but you don't need heavy handed regulation. Like I think that data governance act that's been introduced in Europe is too heavy handed in some areas. They're immediately trying to, regulate um, data sharing trusts, you know, like, and that's a, just an emerging um, sector, like some for nonprofit, some um, interesting sort of partnerships between public and private, that needs to have time to grow and figure out what the business models and the opportunities are. So, but you can have sandboxes, you can have um, some, you can have um, conversations with regulators, you can have other mechanisms that ensure that there's that ongoing discussion, which then builds up the skills of government regulators to find a more nuanced technology policy, you know, approach. But, but for example, you know, uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act, let's say the Californian GDPR, if we can say, uh, right, for example, says that an, until you reach 50,000 users, right, you have a kind of a light approach to, let's say, enforcing full, let's say, uh, uh, data uh, access and portability rights, because you're a small player, right? It's the burden, the burden is big. And actually we've seen GDPR in Europe that it favors mostly the big fangas and gafas, right? Because they were the one able to, to, to leverage it. So the CCPA, okay, unless you reach 50,000, it's fine. We don't bother you too much. Above 50,000 users at some point, yeah, now you are obliged to, uh, to, to comply. But we, we can imagine a, a 100 million user, then you have to, reach neutral, API neutrality, right? If you reach 100 million users, when, but some people argue that they will split it into companies to have only 50 million users each, whatever. But at some point, yeah, we can have different levels of openness and redistribution depending on the, the, the power or the, 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 the monopolistic or at least the, the traction of companies. Would it be fair to your mind to adopt that point? It would for me. I mean, I would even be, um, a little bit more generous. And I mean, a lot of our statistics, when we look at things, there are the number of people per 100,000. So why not just make 100,000 the, the, ba the basic unit and anything above there, you get more regulatory burden. But I mean, like I wouldn't have a problem with a rideshare platform not offering disability services to 50,000 people. But once that they're getting above that, then they th then disability needs to be part of it, you know, sort of thing as far as if they're trying to be an alternative to taxis or whatever. Anything below that you could maybe say is niche for uh, niche for the douche bros, but you can you could have <laughs> uh, like, so I think there has got to be that little bit of wiggle room. But, you know, if you're trying to offer a population wide service, you know, then um, you need to be looking at accessibility and um, uh, equity from the very beginning. Yeah, so so Tyler, maybe is it a way that could protect, let's say, companies' investment and risk? You know better than than many. The platform strategy it's highly risky. It's highly uh, demanding of the top talent, the top infrastructure, and and uh, again, as we sometimes we say, Uber is not yet profitable. It has a huge valuation, but it's not yet profitable. Airbnb. Is, is not uh, profitable. Many, many companies work really were big platforms that changed at least the society in a way, good or bad, but at least that had a lot of impact are not yet plat uh, uh, profitable on their on their uh, uh, value sheet, right? On the balance sheet at the end. So would, would a regulation at least that oblige them to be more open or have more, uh, let's say uh, more constraints over time? Would, would help to protect these innovation investment and entrepreneurial mindset? I think definitely. Um, it, when, when looked at purely through that lens, yes. 
Um, I'd also add that profitability should not be the measure for any of that because um, Uber could be profitable if they wanted to. Um, it's, 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 they're not profitable because they reinvest everything that they get into growing bigger currently. And that's how the, the cycle keeps going. It's, it's a choice not to be profitable once you're at that level of things. Um, they're not just losing money to lose money. They're losing money to reinvest it, to grow into new markets and add new um, product lines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the problem ends up being that we probably create through these sort of measures, uh, I call it an, an arbitrage set of products or industry. And that's um, if I, uh, as a company, um, I won't use my company as an example, but let's say I have that 100,000 user mark and now I'm subject to regulation. Um, new company X comes in, they've got 10,000 users. They now compete against me because they are not subject to the same privacy requirements that I might have. So if I have to both create portability in my API, but also uh, ensure that I am following all the regulations of GDPR and CCPA and at great cost to me, and then a new startup comes in and is like, oh, we can offer all of this data down to the level of the individual user, what their gender is, how much money they make, where they move, what they do. And we just make that all available everywhere up until the point that we have 100,000 users too. That's pretty much unfair competition uh, when, when we're looking between me and this upstart. It's not that uh, it, maybe all of us got to do that on the way up, um, but the regulation should be more fair than that. Like competition shouldn't actually be on the availability to exploit user data on the way up. And um, Facebook's probably kind of argument in this way is, is uh, they are trying to work with regulators now. Let, let's just pretend that that's actually true. And they're trying to work with regulators now to set up what the legislative framework would be for regulating uh, the private interchange of data and uh, the way that works. And, some people might argue that Facebook has no right to do that because they got where they are built on exploiting privacy or at least having breaches along the way and that every company should have the right to exploit and go through breaches on the way just like Facebook did in the, in the name of fair competition. And I think we can generally agree that that can't actually be true. Um, but it doesn't, you can't retroactively punish the organization that got to be where it is um, through violating um, by saying that every other organization um, can also violate, like if they're in good faith, legitimately trying to um, change their ways and thus uh, lift up the whole organization, the, the whole society with it. Um, so in one sense, yes, I think that those sort of regulations are going to be helpful and maybe they will even create a new set of uh, competitors out there that, um, are, are able to do new things, but there certainly needs to be some baseline level of regulation for those. Um, at Tagboard, I can give an example of like, um, we're CCPA compliant, we're GDPR compliant. We went to great lengths to do that. We don't even necessarily have to, but our customers ask us to do that. Um, we, th there's a lot of complexity in being compliant because it's not like Twitter tells us that this user is in the EU that we might have data on. Um, because for their own privacy reasons, they don't transmit um, location information. So like, how are we supposed to even interpret that? So we have to interpret things as it's entirely possible that we have data on EU users in our system because there's EU users on Twitter as an example. But what about a competitor in um, a country, let's say that doesn't have uh, reciprocity laws with the GDPR um, or they're just not even aware of it yet. They're not big enough to even care about this. So uh, are, is being compliant a competitive differentiation for us or is not being compliant a differentiating competitiveness for them? Um, this is an open question because they're able to do things that we don't do um, because they don't have to actually respect this and they don't have to spend as much money respecting it as we do. And, and funny, we, we interviewed some uh, DPOs um, uh, of some big retailer in Europe who got uh, fined, let's say, and it's because some retailers got fines, right? They got the important fines, few millions actually. But actually the, uh, it's funny to see that they're not afraid about the millions mostly, they're afraid about the impact, the PR impact 
that all the company they work with, they send data with, we say, okay, we if you send us data that is actually not respecting the, the, the law, actually we are then uh, not respecting the law because we use data that is not respecting the law. And so the ecosystem of the data market is actually uh, collapsed and everybody stopped to work with this company that has a lot more impact than the few millions on the balance sheet, right? So. So yeah, uh, we. Uh, I, it's, it's the it's cost of doing I, business. If there, if there wasn't the PR aspect, uh, I'm sure that Facebook would just like, yeah, we will pay ten million dollars in fines for violating things. Or various companies would be like, yes, we can just pay these fines, assuming they have the revenue to support it, because it's just the cost of doing business. Um, but the PR aspect actually adds a whole different bunch of that because. Um, that can be used as a cudgel against them in a way that impacts their business a lot more than that $10 million would have. Mark, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, you're right. On, the, on Twitter today, there's a whole discussion around New York Times who um, actually say, if you ask for their data portability, the New York Times says, we could do that, but you're in an area that's not actually governed by data portability regulation where we have to, so we're not going to give it to you. <laughs> and so there's, you know, a big flame war about the fact that everyone wants to pull away from New York Times just because they're showing that sort of hand. Yeah, for, for the last round, uh, um, I may, may ask Kin also uh, to, to, uh, to answer uh, the question because Kin, uh, a few years ago, you, you, uh, you co-founded, uh, uh, you know, the API strategy conference to help evangelize policymakers, businesses, individuals, and APIs. And a few years ago, also, you pushed the idea of API commons, right? You know, being sure the API copyright was was at, at least uh, in the license that was available for everybody to mix the Oracle versus to, to, to stop the Oracle versus Google case on APIs being copyrightable. What we can do next for at least giving to people the ability to think things in API neutrality in a in a, in, in a further way for the one who wants, for the one who wants to go in that direction? Well, I mean, I think it's in alignment with where most enterprises are already headed with just their overall API governance and, and trying to do be better at what they do when it comes to APIs. And so it's using open API specification, async API, JSON schema, so that you, all your database, all your digital assets and, and resources are, are well-defined as JSON schema. You know where they are, you have a discovery strategy. So when someone asks via takeout system, you know where your stuff is. I don't think any of this is 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 out of whack with where businesses want want to be. They want to be agile, nimble, flexible. All the things that APIs bring to the table, they want to have the awareness brought by by API management. So these things aren't out of whack. Like regulation and and the way businesses operate. Really, what we need is more of that. More open APIs and JSON schemas that are commonly shared. So fire specification, PSD two. Um, we need more of these out there and people respecting them and at the table evolving and iterating upon them. So we need more of those common vocabulary uh, for how we do business and how we, we share these bits and bytes, whether they're mandated or not. And then we need that regulatory layer to come in and kind of help you know, give a boost to that, whether it's, and reg regulations aren't always stop doing that. Regulations can be, hey, small business, we'll give you $100,000 if you do that ahead of time. You know, there are other ways to incentivize this. And then I would leave it at, we need more conversation because all the things that Tyler says, like, I mean, like I, uh, Tyler and I used to argue and butt heads about a lot of things. And then he's convinced me on some fronts. I've convinced him on some fronts. We've had lots of discussions out in the open. Um, Mark uh, Boyd and I, I think, get along more as far as the CI, I, I, so we don't butt heads, but we push things forward. We just need a forum for these things to occur because the, 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 the number of startups who have come along and, and I've advocated for, been an advocate, then reach the size, and then they start pulling up the ladder behind them and shutting off their APIs. I mean, I can count so many of them, and it, and it frustrates me. We need conversations about what are the what's all the, the invisible things going on that we don't see. The tech of APIs is pretty abstract, but pretty well proven. The business of APIs is, is fairly well defined, but the politics of APIs we just don't see it happening. We didn't see all of Facebook's games in the moment. And I studied this full time and I didn't see their games. 
So we need a form that's that's arbitrated, that's that's open, that's observable, that we can all discuss these things in real time because it's going to be a constantly changing landscape. There's going to be good and bad. We just need to be constantly having these discussions out in the open and hopefully in 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 the back room of some bars across Europe and 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 the US again, like we used to in the old days. I miss those days. When it will be available. And just to say it's true, we talk about value. Uh, whatever, because we try to put the number somewhere, you know, to put a limit, a binary limit. And I like the idea you said, you know, data is me, is, you know, it, it's my, and, and at least in Europe, there is, there is a regulation say that, you know, uh, uh, the body of the people belongs to them, right? They own their body. And just to say, we try to do some portability requests. So look, my data is an extension of my body in the digital world. According to this regulation about the body ownership, yeah, I should have access to my data because you don't respect this top top regulation that you vi you violate my body, right? We didn't have any answer. We didn't want to go in that direction, but we try. <laughs> We've tried to push to really find to to find other ways for people to to understand portability, right? In not just a number, uh, not just the number. And actually, that was the, the last question we can we we can answer from Haluk is that does that make sense to make a data balance sheet? On companies to say, oh, look, this is actually the value we make from data, right? Uh, 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 yeah. So, Mark, would that would that work for you? You've worked a lot with banks in PSD two, right? You know, for banks to declare data on their balance sheet, say, look, yeah, this is actually our, our worth of data. Would that make sense? I think um, I'd like to see the banks move towards being able to demonstrate that they're um, in they're improving financial health of um, businesses and citizens by making open banking available and that that's been done, done in a way that's going to also address carbon costs in the future and you know like we can also use it as an economic uh, sorry as an environmental um, budgeting thing um, as well in the future but I think for so I think there is some opportunity there where I see the bigger opportunity is when Kim mentioned fire um, API standard and like if they which is the um, health standard and I think that's an easier one it goes to your argument of an extension of the body as well and like there are, it would be great to see you know where we find that balance between your private health data that's on your um, uh, Strava or on your on, on your um, Fitbit or whatever and versus you being able to share that data in a pool so it's it can be used for improving personalized health medicine. It could be used for vaccine development. It can be used in um, scientific research. Where the balance is between um, private data there and public, uh, public data. And that's getting to Haluk's point of like, it's not about um, economic value. It's about social good value of the data, you know? And there's a lot that could be done with that. And I hope that sort of conversation is something um, that, that all of this, I'm, oh, finally to finish up, I'm really, grateful for all of the attendees. There's a big bunch of um, policy makers or people involved in policy circles in Europe, in European Commission who are sitting through all of this webinar and they're like thinking about how do I incorporate that in, in my work? And so it's great to have you all here and thinking through this and putting a, a realizing APIs isn't something that you allude to in your policy, but you actually say, this is an API and this is part of our policy framework going forward. So it's great. And, and, and Tyler, uh, from the platform point of view, you've, you've, you've know, you know really well how top word platforms actually works and operate. What would be your, your, your advice for policymakers or businesses in Europe to, to understand platforms, let's say ecosystem management and finding the right, the right balance on, 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 on opening APIs or not? I think um, there's a tendency to assume that these platforms and platforms in general are in their final form today and that somehow we arrived here on purpose, one, and two, that uh, it's not a work in progress even still. And uh, uh, to, to kind of respect the danger of that, um, it it may be beneficial through regulation to impose um, less innovation um, by way of having regulation ensure that things conform to a standard so that they can quit being a moving target. Um, 
on the the point of like the uh, uh, the balance sheet of data things, uh, that that's kind of like an example that I think it overstates uh, the understanding that um, platforms generally have of their users, like the way that that data is organized. Uh, it's less that you have a balance sheet of monetizability than you are part of a divisor at the end of an app, uh, uh, at the end of an equation that you are you know one of the twenty that's in divided by twenty rather than a uh, uh, you know parentheses and each individual user inside of that twenty. That's not how things like actually end up working. Um, it could. Uh, there could be a world where they do that, but that would be a massive reorganization of information. Um, and maybe that kind of thing needs to be imposed uh, so that that is possible. Um, so I, I don't know, I think largely just uh, keeping in mind that the world is always in motion and that uh, a lot of how we got where we were wasn't necessarily by nefarious choice, but by accident and by reaction and by a series of bad choices along the way, um, which were good choices maybe at the time or were bad choices all along, but they were the choices that were made and everything's just made up of this snowball effect of change. Yeah, when you have uh, hundreds of million of users, if not perfect decisions can have big consequence. Uh, I agree, and and some forget. Yes. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's really hard. Unless you you manage hundred million million users, you can't understand, right? You know, maybe can the, the last word. I think we have Rafael Rafael Piotrowski who said something like kind of fun. He said it was, a it was a really valuable event, but I hope I will be not be taxed on this value, right? <laughs> so so I think we agree with you on. Sometimes we talk too much about uh, uh, about the money, the value, uh, right? But uh, maybe the value is somewhere else. What would be your last comment on where is the value in all of this? Well, I think I think there's a lot of perceived value uh, across the board. It's it's the value to me as a consumer, the value to me as a developer, the value to me as a platform owner, um, the value to me as a politician, a regulator. Um, I think it just comes comes down to like so much other aspects of our economy that uh, the, the equit equitability, you know, like that, that's gotta be evenly balanced across, across those actors. And I think right now, you know, I've seen APIs uh, too often in the last decade be turned on and be democratic, changing the game, democratizing something, uh, some digital resource, some digital asset until that point in time where then you start turning down the fire hose or you start redirecting that value generation to, to the platform. And I just think we've got to have, we've got to have more mechanisms to be able to have the conversation about how do we, how do we start shifting that back so that the, the value to the end user is a little bit more uh, honest, open. Um, I think the, the privacy and, and, and the, the honesty around what users are, are aware of and, and have the capacity kind of to understand and, and get because they're not immersed in all of this tech and they're not invest, immersed in all of this venture capital uh, goings on. Um, at what point, you know, does another hand have to come in and kind of tilt that, that balance back? I think that for me, the API management layer of APIs is, is where we can have this conversation and we can do it in a way that, that protects the IP of companies, acknowledges everything that Tyler said, because I think he's right. I mean, we're making this stuff up as we go along in the tech space. That's kind of the dirty secret. But that means we've got to be more cautious. We've got to slow a little bit. The industry's maturing. We've got to start being more thoughtful. And that's what the the regulatory kind of uh, clouds moving in mean. And and we, we've got to grow up and we've got to be a little bit more uh, respectful of, of everyone involved. And I, you know, I think API provide or companies uh, need to see embrace APIs, understand them. And they're not going to be so threatened by this. Um, and it, it's most are going to see it as an opportunity. Yeah. Yep. Thank you very much for all of you. Let's remind that well, all we know about APIs, they are as much as exposing capabilities that hiding, you know, things that uh, doesn't don't need to be shared or should not be shared. And so finding this limit between allowing ecosystem to grow, but allowing also the the owner to not be diluted completely and die from delusion is really hard. And, and yes, and we hope this event helped policymakers and business owners to find uh, uh, that limit. 
we've sh we've seen also that yeah G Europe has many regulation in place that are really thinking forward but sometimes the implementation by companies is not there yet and so we hope you you understood that APIs for some parts can be a solution if they are pushed enough but and uh, now it will be the, the, your decision to know where it should be put at right level uh, at what level and with what recommendations or or um, or uh, directions that needs to be put it has been done with PSD2. Does GDPR need to be inspired by it? Does GDPR is wider? This is will be this is will be you who will decide. But thank you, Kin. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Tyler. And maybe for the last word, Monica, you wanna can you give some elements where people will be able to find the video uh, on the European Commission website? Yes, indeed. Well, I sent uh, on over the the chat uh, where where we are going to publicize the all the material and uh, a summary of of uh, of what has happened today. But first of all, I would like to thank you all so much for 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 this amazing uh, event. Uh, you've given uh, so much food for thought, and um, I really want to to give a special thanks to our speakers and and panelists. Nestor Dutch Brown, Francois Xavier, Marco Sagariaris, Kin Lane, Tyler, and Mark Boyd um, for the deep dive into the European data strategy, objectives, issues to solve, actions, and context, for the analysis of the and of the highlights of data portability implementation. Um, and, and the reflection on whether there is a, a missed opportunity uh, there uh, for the thoroughly uh, overview of the role of APIs in PSD2. So the business model, the architectures, the new research questions, such as the risk assessment uh, related to the uncertainty and data value chains. And indeed for the lively discussion about uh, the role of APIs um, and how to, to, to be able, all the ideas that you put on the table that uh, may be used for, for maximizing um, the, the social welfare around uh, data governance. Um, thanks. Thank you very much for, for your contribution. And I really hope that we can um, keep this conversation alive, maybe in the future, when um, these, um, all, all these um, regulatory initiatives that are being now um, developed, both on the incentive side and on the uh, more uh, constrained side, um, will have a little bit more, will be a little bit more draft and we can have a little bit more focused discussions. So thank, thank you very much to you and to all the participants that have um, put uh, their, their um, valuable questions on it. Thank so, um, and, and with this, um, yeah, um, I think that we can close the event and just to say that we will uh, be publishing everything on our um, AI, uh, API for, uh, for uh, digital transformation um, website and you will receive it through, um, you will be receiving an email for, for uh, announcing the, the publication of all the material. Yeah, thank you very much uh, all. And uh, yes, we will close uh, the, the webinar in a few seconds. So uh, uh, yeah, we see there are some participants and when Zoom close, it's uh, it's kind of uh, abrupt <laughs> and, and and quite of strong. So yeah, we have a few seconds to to leave smoothly before we cut uh, we cut <laughs> we cut everything <laughs> strong, right? And yeah, we let some some seconds for you to say thank you, uh, like Philip, Katarzyna, Alouk, Victoria, thank you. Thank you. And if you have any questions, again, speakers are available, accessible on networks, uh, uh, right, to, to continue the discussion. Right. Uh, thank you very much. We hope it was helpful. And uh, yeah, some people are still want to stay. No, they're leaving. Perfect. <laughs> okay.